Hello, Constance. Ok. On s'approche du, euh, du nombre d'inscrits. Ok, donc on va, on va démarrer. Bonjour à, à tous. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, bienvenue pour uh, cette uh, session donc, du séminaire thématique uh, européen. Je, je vous souhaite la, la bienvenue donc, aux, aux étudiants du, uh, du master Genevois de formation des, des adultes. Uh, je suis très heureux de vous retrouver. Uh, on s'était vu l'année passée en, en Zoom en pensant qu'on se reverrait peut-être uh, en présentiel, mais ce n'est pas le cas, uh, hélas. Donc, uh, la pandémie fait qu'on se retrouve aujourd'hui encore à, à distance, mais enfin, ça me fait plaisir de, de vous retrouver dans, ce, dans cette nouvelle configuration. Euh, je voulais souhaiter aussi la bienvenue aux étudiants de Fribourg. Donc, on a, on a fait trois personnes euh, de Fribourg. Donc, il y a Pauline euh, qui est là. Euh, il y a Natacha, normalement. Est-ce que Natacha est avec nous C'est elle qui a des problèmes de connexion. Elle qui a des problèmes de connexion. Elle arrive. J'espère que ce sera résolu. Et puis, Anda. Voilà. Bonjour à, à donc vous trois, en espérant que Natacha nous rejoindra bientôt. Uh, I also wanted to uh, welcome um, Constance uh, Tress from uh, the University of Luxembourg. Uh, so, Constance is doing a doctoral uh, research on uh, apprenticeship in Luxembourg, and so she was interested in attending this workshop. So uh, welcome also Constance to this uh, today's uh, workshop. Et puis je voulais aussi uh, saluer uh, Ayla Bimonte um, qui um, est assistante dans mon équipe et qui va m'assister um, pour ce cours. Donc also welcome to Ayla Bimonte who is the uh, teaching and research assistant uh, for this course and she will also be involved in uh, Uh, addressing some uh, questions and um, responding to students in the, in the work group for these two days. Voilà, j'espère que j'ai oublié personne. Uh, donc, um, on est ici. So, I, I will do a brief uh, introduction in French, so Stephen, that you understand. So, of course, also a particular welcome to Stephen Billet. Um, I will introduce him uh, more extensively in a, in a couple of minutes. Um, so I, I hope, Stephen, you can just uh, be patient a couple of minutes so that I introduce the seminar in, uh, in French. Okay. Uh, donc, quelques informations un peu pratiques sur, uh, sur ce uh, séminaire. Donc, uh, uh, on a aujourd'hui le, le premier des deux séminaires thématiques européens. Donc, uh, celui qui a lieu aujourd'hui et demain avec uh, Stephen Billet. Il y en aura un autre qui sera proposé au mois de mars et qui sera animé par Nathalie Muller-Mirza avec un autre invité. Et donc, vous savez que vous devez suivre ces deux séminaires thématiques pour une évaluation qui est globale. Pour les deux, je reviendrai sur la question de, de l'évaluation. Donc, on a la chance aujourd'hui, enfin, vous avez la chance aujourd'hui de pouvoir passer deux jours avec une personne qui est quand même très experte dans le domaine des apprentissages en situation de travail. Donc, ça va être la thématique de ces deux journées, la problématique de l'apprentissage dans et par la pratique. Donc l'objectif, c'est que vous puissiez à la fois approfondir un peu vos, vos connaissances euh, académiques dans le champ du, du workplace learning euh, au niveau de son appareillage conceptuel euh, et de ses références un peu, euh, un peu théoriques. Euh, mais aussi, euh, l'objectif, c'est que vous puissiez vous, vous outiller aussi des dimensions plus appliquées de cette, euh, de cette problématique des apprentissages au travail, parce que vous allez le voir, Steven Gillette va Bonjour. être aussi très... Euh, très pragmatique et très ancré sur des dimensions pédagogiques et formatives qui peuvent être des, des, des prolongements ou des applications de, de la problématique des apprentissages au travail. Donc l'idée c'est aussi de vous outiller en matière pédagogique sur comment est-ce qu'on peut agir sur la qualité des apprentissages au travail, par quelles pratiques, par quels dispositifs et comment est-ce qu'on peut être amené aussi à intégrer davantage ces apprentissages en lien avec le travail avec des parcours et des curriculums éducatifs. Donc, on va travailler aussi sur la thématique de l'alternance, de l'intégration et de l'usage en formation de l'expérience du, du travail. 
Donc ça, c'est un peu pour les objectifs de ce, euh, de ce séminaire. Euh, vous avez vu le, le programme. Je vais euh, partager mon écran et puis euh, rapidement passer en revue la manière dont ça va se, euh, se dérouler. Donc, ça va être un séminaire qui sera synchrone. Donc, on va passer la journée d'aujourd'hui et la journée de demain euh, ensemble euh, sur Zoom. On ne sera pas toujours en plénière. Il y aura des activités, même beaucoup d'activités dans lesquelles vous serez euh, en sous-groupe. Donc, euh, il y aura vraiment une, une alternance sur les modalités. Mais on a souhaité que ce, ce, ce séminaire reste euh, essentiellement euh, synchrone. Euh, les matinées vont être euh, en en présence physique, en tout cas à distance, de Steven Billett. Donc, il faut savoir qu'il y a 9 heures de décalage horaire avec l'Australie, donc c'est 5h30 pour, pour lui. Donc, il sera là, présent les matins et les après-midi. C'est moi et Ayla qui animeront les activités avec, avec vous. Et puis, pour les activités de l'après-midi, il a enregistré des, des conférences sur vidéo. Et puis, donc, on, va les, on les verra ensemble. Donc, les... Les activités du matin auront lieu avec Steven Billett, les activités de l'après-midi auront lieu sans lui, mais avec son, son contenu et avec aussi le, les activités pédagogiques qu'il a imaginées pour, pour vous. Les horaires, donc on va rester sur les horaires standards du master, donc ce sera 8h30 midi, 13h30, 17h. Ça, ce sera un peu pour les les grandes plages, à l'intérieur de ces plages, on va vraiment s'adapter aussi à, au rythme d'avancement du travail. C'est difficile à, à savoir précisément comment on va avancer. Euh, disons qu'on va alterner des moments d'apport de, de contenu et des moments d'activité en sous-groupe et des moments de restitution en plénière et de discussion générale. Euh, je serai aussi assez sensible à prévoir des, des pauses, peut-être plusieurs brèves pauses, euh, en tenant compte aussi du travail à, à distance et puis de la fatigue que ça peut occasionner. Donc, on va aussi essayer de fabriquer un programme qui soit viable. Si jamais, n'hésitez pas aussi à, à manifester vos, euh, vos besoins de, de pause à certains moments, si jamais euh, j'oubliais d'être sensible à cette, euh, à cette dimension. Euh, voilà, donc le, le programme, vous avez vu, il est, il est structuré autour de, de quatre grands chapitres. Au fait, on va, enfin, Stephen Billet va vous présenter euh, quatre euh, talks euh, sur quatre thématiques différentes. Deux de ces talks auront lieu le matin en, en live et puis deux auront lieu euh, l'après-midi sous forme de capsule vidéo. Euh, et puis, l'idée du programme en termes de contenu, c'est d'avoir un, un premier chapitre qui porte sur le champ général du workplace learning et du cadre conceptuel, enfin, quels sont les grands concepts de référence de, de, des modèles de l'apprentissage en situation de travail. Ça, c'est ce qu'on va faire ce matin. Euh, cet après-midi, on abordera une autre thématique qui est celle du learning curriculum, ou bien le, le curriculum de la pratique. Et donc là, on, on abordera la, la, la problématique de comment est-ce que les expériences du travail euh, peuvent permettre de, de structurer des parcours d'apprentissage. Hein, donc, on on abordera un peu cette thématique à travers une, une vignette vidéo. Euh, la thématique pour demain, ce sera de parler des pédagogies de la pratique et des épistémologies euh, personnelles liées à la pratique. Donc là, ce sera essentiellement les, euh, les apports pédagogiques euh, que le champ de la formation peut apporter pour euh, essayer d'exploiter de, au mieux l'expérience de travail pour la, la formation. Et puis, demain après-midi, on abordera la thématique de l'intégration entre l'expérience de travail et les expériences de formation en contexte éducatif. Donc, on sera sur la question un peu de l'alternance, de l'intégration. Donc, voilà un peu pour les, euh, les, les grandes balises de ces, de ces quatre chapitres. Et puis, vous allez le voir, on va, on va essayer de construire un programme avec, euh, avec Steven où on, a, on va alterner des, des moments d'apport. De, que Steven va apporter soit en direct, soit euh, par les capsules vidéo, avec des euh, activités qui vont vous être proposées. Et donc, il y a un autre document qui est assez important sur, euh, sur Moodle, euh, qui est la, non, est pas celui -là. Qui est la, la fiche d'activité. Donc, vous, avez, vous allez trouver sur, sur Moodle un document qui s'appelle « Fiche d'activité » avec quatre activités, une pour chaque chapitre. Donc, pour chaque chapitre, il y aura des tâches 
qui vont être faites de manière individuelle ou en sous-groupe et qui vont accompagner en quelque sorte ce, ce processus de, de workshop de, de deux jours. Voilà, donc pour le, le programme, est-ce que vous aviez des, euh, des questions sur, sur le programme général Non N'hésitez pas, hein, c'est évidemment peut-être plus difficile de prendre la parole à, à distance, mais si vous avez des, des questions à ce stade, n'hésitez pas. Euh, je voulais peut-être, avant de, de commencer aussi, euh, revenir euh, en anticipant la question des, de la consigne pour le travail de validation. Donc là aussi, vous avez vu sur Moodle, vous avez un, un document qui s'appelle consigne pour le travail de, de validation. Je vais le partager aussi. Donc, euh, voilà. Donc c'est un document qui figure sous le, le workshop sur, sur Moodle et qui expose en quelque sorte les, euh, les conditions de validation du séminaire thématique européen en général, puis la consigne spécifique pour euh, ce euh, séminaire. Donc juste peut-être pour le cadre général, vous savez, en tout cas pour les étudiants euh, Genevois, que euh, vous devez suivre les deux séminaires, donc celui-ci et celui du mois de mars. Vous devez faire un travail de validation pour chacun des deux selon la consigne qui est spécifique à chaque séminaire. Et puis, euh, nous ferons une moyenne des deux notes. Donc, euh, que vous sachiez comment ça fonctionne. Et si une des deux notes est insuffisante, vous devez faire un travail de rattrapage dans euh, celui des deux, euh, enfin, de, dans, le, dans le domaine dans lequel vous n'avez pas eu un, un acquis. Donc, ça, c'est pour les étudiants Genevois. Pour les étudiants de Fribourg, je crois que vous avez une consigne spécifique. Je crois que là, vous devez faire un, un, un travail d'intégration pour l'ensemble des activités du module européen. C'est bien ça euh, Oui. OK. Du coup, on n'a pas, pas besoin faire... de vous référer à la consigne que je vais préciser après pour les étudiants de Genève. Alors, maintenant, pour, pour le travail de validation de ce séminaire-ci, euh, ce qui vous est demandé, c'est donc de produire individuellement un texte entre 20 et 30 000 caractères euh, que vous allez remettre sur Moodle dans la rubrique « Devoir euh, » d'ici le 4 juin. Donc, l'échéance, elle est sur la fin de l'année. Hein, donc, euh, euh, c'est le 4 juin au plus tard. Maintenant, si vous arrivez à le faire avant, le conseil que je pourrais vous donner, c'est de le faire avant. Peut-être dans la foulée de ce, euh, de ce séminaire, si vous en avez le temps, parce que ce sera peut-être plus difficile pour vous de de remobiliser ou réchauffer ça au printemps prochain. Bref, ce qui vous est demandé, c'est donc de répondre à, à trois questions après avoir participé activement pendant ces deux jours et puis après avoir aussi lu euh, deux des articles de euh, Billette qui figurent sur euh, Moodle. Donc, il y a un dossier avec des lectures. Vous sélectionnez deux textes. Donc, il y en a déjà un des deux que vous êtes supposé avoir lu pour euh, le forum. Et puis, vous allez répondre à trois questions. Donc, dans votre expérience personnelle, qu'elle soit professionnelle ou académique, quels apprentissages avez-vous pu construire en situation de travail En quoi les concepts issus du workplace learning permettent-ils d'éclairer ces apprentissages et leurs conditions de construction Et quels dispositifs pédagogiques pourraient permettre de consolider ces apprentissages Donc, Vous allez voir que ces questions elles sont très en phase avec tout ce qu'on va faire pendant ces deux jours. Vous allez voir aussi que dans les activités qu'on va vous proposer, vous allez être amené à identifier des situations que vous connaissez et puis à les éclairer à travers les différents concepts que, que Stephen Billet va vous présenter. Et donc, ça veut dire que si vous faites euh, de manière sérieuse et appliquée les activités pendant ces deux jours, vous avez déjà toute la matière pour répondre à cette consigne. Donc, en fait, toutes les tâches que vous allez faire pendant ces deux jours en, en sous-groupe euh, vous préparent à répondre à ces questions. Donc, si vous les faites de manière engagée, vous avez déjà une grande partie du travail de validation qui est faite. Après, il faut la formaliser sous la forme d'un texte. Voilà, c'était juste de vous rappeler cette consigne en amont parce qu'il euh, y a une logique aussi par rapport aux activités qu'on va vous proposer dans euh, ces, euh, ces deux jours. Des questions sur la, sur la validation Oui, moi j'ai une question. Oui, Fadi Bonjour, euh, 
Bonjour. Euh, je voulais savoir si, euh, si on vous rendait le, le, le premier travail en avance, est-ce qu'on on on pouvait obtenir un feedback Vous voulez un feedback formatif avant de, de soumettre le travail Ou bien vous voulez savoir ouais. quelle note vous avez eue ben, Un peu les deux. <rire> ah, ce n'est pas la même chose, en fait. Parce que si c'est un feedback formatif, après, enfin, c'est des navettes qu'on fait entre, entre euh, vous et nous. Euh, je veux dire, ça, ça, ça peut être relativement lourd pour nous d'avoir de, de, 28 travaux euh, sur lesquels on va faire des, des, des navettes. Par contre, c'est vrai que si vous nous envoyez euh, le travail avant, peut-être qu'on peut on pourra vous, vous communiquer la, la note avant la, la fin de l'année. D'accord. Bon, normalement, on n'est pas supposé le, le faire, mais on pourra, on pourra éventuellement euh, faire ça. Mais donc, on n'est on est, on est pas sur l'idée de faire des navettes entre... Euh, une version brouillon, une version 1 euh... Non, 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 c'était pour le travail final. D'accord. Ouais. Donc, vous soumettez votre travail et puis euh, on, on, on essayera de vous donner un, un feedback avant le mois de, de juillet. Enfin, quand je dis un feedback, c'est l'évaluation que vous avez obtenue. Mm -hmm. okay. Mais n'oubliez pas que de toute manière, vous devez avoir un acquis dans les deux travaux. Hein. Mm -hmm. Donc, euh... ok. Merci. D'autres questions moi, j'ai juste une question pratique. Au pratique, est-ce que vous allez enregistrer les, les sessions qu'on va faire ensemble Exactement. Donc là, là, vous avez vu, je suis déjà en train d'enregistrer. Ah, euh, je vais faire attention. Merci. Ouais. En fait, les, je vais, on va enregistrer les sessions plénières. Par contre, les sessions en sous-groupe, ce n'est pas possible de les euh, techniquement, puis ça n'aurait pas d'intérêt. Enfin, je ne dis pas que ça n'aurait pas d'intérêt, mais euh, l'idée, c'est de... Donc, on va enregistrer les sessions plénières mais pas les, euh, les, sessions, euh, les sessions de travail en sous-groupe. Ok, merci. Et puis, euh, et puis ensuite, je mettrai à disposition ça sur, euh, sur Moodle. Donc, c'est vrai que s'il y a des choses qui, euh, qui vont un peu vite, vous pourrez y revenir aussi euh, éventuellement. Euh, je vois que Natacha est arrivée, donc elle a, elle a trouvé un moyen de se connecter. Bienvenue à Natacha. Oui, merci. Ok. Euh, super, est-ce que vous avez encore des questions sur la, sur le, la validation Ok, alors juste peut-être encore quelques mots euh, pratico-pratiques. Donc, euh, vous avez vu qu'il y a euh, toutes sortes de ressources sur euh, Moodle. J'y ai fait référence euh, déjà. Donc, euh, le programme du séminaire, les questions préparatoires, vous les avez déjà euh, bien, vous les connaissez bien euh, J'ai aussi déposé hier euh, une traduction en anglais des réponses au forum, en fait. Euh, quelques réponses étaient en, en anglais, mais la majorité des réponses étaient en français pour que Steven Billet puisse les lire. J'ai fait une traduction automatique, donc ça vaut ce que ça vaut. Mais euh, si vous voulez une version anglaise de vos euh, propos, voir ce que ça donne, euh, c'est ici. Euh, task sheet, fiche d'activité, on va s'y référer beaucoup. Ce sera toutes les consignes pour le travail de, de sous-groupe qu'on va faire euh, à différents moments. Ici, vous avez les articles de, euh, de Steven Billet qui sont à disposition. Éventuellement, il y en aura d'autres selon les, les échanges et les discussions. Ça, c'est un dossier important. Euh, Steven Billet va souvent faire référence à des brochures euh, qu'il qu utilise aussi dans ses, dans ses formations. Et une de ses brochures est traduite en français. Donc, vous aurez la version anglaise et française de cette brochure à laquelle il va faire référence, euh, que vous pourrez aussi utiliser dans les travaux de, de groupe. Ici, vous avez le diaporama des quatre exposés. Euh, vous avez les capsules vidéo pour cet après-midi et demain après-midi. Ça, on va y revenir. La consigne pour le travail. Et puis, euh, l'endroit le, pour le dépôt des, euh, de vos travaux de, de validation. Voilà, donc vous avez euh, ici toutes les ressources. Si jamais il y a d'autres ressources nécessaires, elles, elles seront ajoutées euh, ici. Juste euh, en mode de, pour fonctionner avec Zoom, ce que je vous propose, c'est de bien garder vos caméras allumées parce que c'est toujours plus sympathique de voir les gens à qui on s'adresse. Par contre, comme vous l'avez déjà bien fait, de, de bien couper vos micros, euh, mais bien de les enclencher, euh, de vous sentir en tout cas légitimé à les enclencher quand vous avez des questions à poser. Donc, n'hésitez pas aussi à intervenir, à poser des questions. Vous pouvez poser des questions en français également. Euh, et puis moi, je peux les traduire. 
ou quelques autres personnes. J'ai vu que des, euh, des, des personnes parmi vous se débrouillent bien en anglais, donc on peut aussi euh, faire un travail de, de traduction. Euh, vous pouvez aussi euh, intervenir par le, le chat. Hein. Donc, si, si vous voulez euh, poser des questions, euh, n'hésitez pas à le faire et même vous êtes vraiment encouragé à, à profiter de ces, de ces options-là. Comme je le disais, j'enregistre les plénières, mais pas les sous-groupes. Et puis au niveau de la langue, c'est clair que c'est un peu un défi de, de tenir un, un workshop en, en langue anglaise. J'ai bien conscience que vous n'êtes pas tous des, des locuteurs euh, euh, bilingues. L'objectif n'est pas, pas celui-ci. Mais euh, enfin, sachez en tout cas qu'on euh, on pourra, enfin, on peut organiser aussi des des moments de traduction du français vers l'anglais si vous avez des commentaires ou des questions. Dans les sous-groupes, vous pourrez peut-être aussi vous aider si jamais il y a des choses que vous n'avez pas bien comprises. Et puis, vous avez aussi un certain nombre de ressources en français qui ont été mises à disposition, que ce soit la brochure ou les textes. Donc, euh, voilà. Mais même enfin, si vous n'êtes pas suffisamment en confiance pour interagir en anglais, sentez-vous tout à fait légitime aussi de, de, de poser des questions en français. L'après-midi, on sera entre nous, il n'y a pas de problème. Mais pour la matinée, euh, on, a, on a souvent fonctionné comme ça avec Steven et ça ne pose pas de problème, vous posez votre question je la traduis et puis euh, on, peut, on peut très bien interagir de cette manière ok est-ce que vous avez encore des, des questions sur le plan euh, pratique ok, so now okay, it, uh, une question, oui, une question. Euh, juste Jessica. pour le travail de validation oui. Euh, c'est français obligatoire ou c'est un choix anglais-français euh, Non, alors on va, on va, j'étais parti du principe que, que vous allez le faire en français. Maintenant, si vous tenez à le faire en anglais, il euh, n'y a pas de problème. Bon, C'était euh, juste une question pour, euh, pour savoir, vu que tout le contenu est donné en anglais. Ouais. Juste pour... Donc, c'est vrai que si vous avez, euh, si vous avez la possibilité de l'écrire en anglais, du moment que les contenus euh, ont été apportés en anglais aussi, c'est peut-être plus simple. Mais donc, euh, en tout cas, ce n'est pas une contrainte de l'écrire en anglais. Ça, soyez, soyez rassurés. Mais si vous voulez l'écrire en, en anglais, il n'y a pas de souci. Le, le travail sera, sera évalué par Ayla et moi-même. Euh, on fera un compte-rendu aussi à Steven un peu de, de ce qui est ressorti dans ses travaux, mais ce n'est pas lui qui va faire le, le, le travail d'évaluation. Donc, c'est pourquoi on peut, on peut vous demander de le faire en français. Moi, j'ai juste une autre question, si oui. c'est possible. Oui. Euh, un, alors, je, je parle anglais relativement, enfin, je, je comprends bien l'anglais. Par contre, au niveau des concepts, la traduction de ces concepts, ça risque d'être un peu compliqué. Mmh. <rire> Genre avoir l'exact le, le, mot pour ce qu'on veut dire, mmh. sachant que ça a été utilisé en anglais, comment on fait pour les traduire en français après Bon, après, je pense que ça, en effet, ça, c'est typiquement le genre de question que vous pourriez poser au, au cours des exposés, peut-être. Euh... De, de, de demander comment est-ce qu'on traduirait les concepts qui vont être présentés en français. Alors, vous, a, vous allez voir que dans la, la brochure, le leaflet, il y a la version anglaise et la version française. Donc ça, ça peut être un bon moyen parce que je pense que tous les concepts qu'on va présenter pendant ces deux jours sont présentés dans cette, dans cette brochure. Et la brochure, elle existe dans les deux langues. Donc ce sera peut-être un outil aussi après coup pour voir comment certains concepts ont été traduits. Notamment, il y a une rubrique euh, définition dans cette brochure. Mais après, pour toutes les pratiques pédagogiques ou les pratiques épistémiques, il y a une traduction en français. Donc, euh, référez-vous à ce document, ça va vous être utile. D'accord, merci. Il y avait d'autres questions Ok, so if there is no question, it's my great pleasure to um, welcome Stephen Billet. Uh, and thank him very much for um, being with us today. So it's, I think, Stephen, it's uh, something like six o'clock evening in uh, Brisbane. So Stephen uh, had already a long day work and he's uh, very generous with his time. He's spending uh, his uh, late afternoon and evening with, uh, with us. So thank you very much uh, for, for that. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have you uh, invited in our master's program. It's, uh, I mean, as you know, it's not the first time that you, um, that you come uh, in, um, in the program. It's the first time that we organize this uh, workshop through Zoom. I mean, it would have been good to have you in Geneva, uh, although the weather is terrible today, but uh, 
it's probably better to be in Brisbane than in Geneva today. Um, so, I mean, for the students, uh, uh, as you may know or not know, I mean, Stephen uh, Billet has a very long experience, um, not only as a worker, he is, he's been um, working um, as um, a professional in the clothing industry. So he has a professional background in, uh, in, in um, the clothes making industry. He, is a, he has also a very long experience as a, a vocational trainer. He has been teaching apprentices in the field of uh, the, the clothing skills. And also, of course, he has a very uh, large and uh, strong experience in research on workplace learning. He's one of the best uh, known uh, researchers in, uh, in this uh, area. And, and he has developed lots of collaborations, not only with university programs for integrating work and uh, educational programs, but also a large experience with uh, international collaborations with uh, different countries on the topic of uh, workplace uh, learning. So it's, uh, it's a great um, honor and pleasure to have you uh, with us, Stephen. And uh, maybe I just wanted to share, um, it's, it's, a, it, it's a little bit of not, not a joke, but it's, it's uh, something I wanted to uh, share with students because I don't know if you are, are aware of that, but uh, Stephen Billet, um, received um, a honorary doctorate in uh, November at the University of Geneva. So he, he received a, a, a doctora honoris causa from our uh, university. So this is a picture of the ceremony where Stephen was uh, sitting in his office and receiving um, a doctora honoris causa from the rector of the University of uh, Geneva. So it's, a, it's also a testimony to his long collaboration with us at the University of Geneva. So a recognition of his very large uh, expertise and uh, recognition of his uh, work in the domain of adult education. So it's not every year that the field of adult education gets so much visibility within our university. And so we are also grateful to Stephen for having given us the opportunity to um, make our field a little bit more visible within uh, our own university. Okay, so uh, I'm very happy to give you the floor, Stephen, for this uh, morning session, and uh, I'm very uh, happy that uh, you can join us. And I look forward also uh, having uh, our students engaged uh, in discussing with you. Thank you, Laurent, and uh, thank you for that very kind introduction. And it's a great pleasure for me to engage with colleagues from Geneva, also um, University of Freiburg and Luxembourg, that's very nice um, from here. Um, as Laurent said previously, I've been able to travel to Geneva to engage with you. Um, it's not possible under the current circumstances and hopefully we'll still be able to have a reasonably interactive session. Unfortunately, I don't speak any French and so that um, limits um, the degree by which I can engage, but previously we've managed around with um, Laurent doing translation and people when feeling comfortable enough to speak in English or uh, amongst yourselves in French, which is just fine by me. Um, so this is a great opportunity and what I'd like to do over the next two days working with you is start with a consideration of the workplace as a learning environment and then go through and some considerations of its strengths and limitations, the ways in which learning through work can be supported within the work setting. And then finally, a consideration of how we can integrate the experiences that students have in the workplace within tertiary education institu institutions. And um, you know, what, what you refer to as alternates. So that's the overall plan. And in terms of how we'll progress today, firstly, we will just give some consideration to the, um, the focus questions which you all responded to so very um, effectively. And I just need to bring up my slides here, and I hope I bring up the correct one. So I'm just going, yes, that's great. So what we'll do today is Laurent has provided this introduction. You, I hope you can all see that, is that all clear? 
yeah. And then um, an introduction to learning through work, um, traditions about that, um, the strengths and weaknesses of learning through work activity, and then some considerations of conceptualizing learning through work. And I've already seen from your responses to the focus questions that you've already engaged with some of those ideas. And then, um, then a consideration then of the concept of learning curriculum, which will be discussed through a recorded talk, which I've, I've made the other day and Laurent um, has on his list there. So that's how we'll proceed today. But um, we set you those focus questions and I guess, um, oops, um, in terms of how we proceed with these, I won't go into them in any great depth, except to say it was great to see that you engaged with these ideas and you had, um, um, you could find some sense in them, you could critique them, and you could also um, draw upon other literature and other ideas that were related to it. So there was just a couple of questions that I had, and um, um, one of them was, um, I think, two, two colleagues, um, Alex and, um, sorry, um, Alexandria, referred to uh, professional circles, and I wasn't quite sure what that meant. So I'd appreciate just if um, you could just help me understand what that concept means. Uh, C'était Axel, je pense. Il a dit Alexandre, non? What was it, Stephen? Was it uh, Alexandre? Alexander? Yeah. Or? Alexander and also um, Alex? Alex. Alex Alexel? Well, Alexandre. Alexel, uh, yeah. yeah. So I just, wasn't, I just wasn't sure what that concept meant. That was all. Yeah. Um, Okay, because this was this was also translated. I mean, um, Alexander. Ah, uh, it could be a translation thing. I, I, don't, I don't know. So, what was the concept? You did not uh, quite understand. Well, well, it is referring to a professional field because it was saying that within learning professional circles, these ideas weren't taken seriously. So, I was just curious about um, a um, uh, what that was. That was all. Yeah. I'm just. Um, trying to come back to this. It's no problem, it's no problem, yeah. Okay, it was just one, one concept that I was, yeah. I was just having some uh, struggles with, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. So um, there were these focus questions which you responded to very, um, very fully, which was great. <coughs> and on the slide um, that you'll have copies of, I've generated some ideas about responses to, to these questions, and I'll quickly go through those, but I think you largely covered them. And so why is there this current interest in workplaces as learning environments? And as many of you said, there's key economic concerns currently, and governments are very concerned about the need for skilled labor, for instance, and so, um, that governments are concerned that, um, that people learn skills that are applicable in the workplace. And then as many of you mentioned in your responses, change is very pervasive everywhere. And so enterprises want um, workers who have the ability to be productive in the workplace, but also respond to these changes which are um, uh, which are ongoing. And um, also, um, and the professions and trades, they often require that people have extensive practice-based experience to be accepted uh, within those occupations. And then increasingly with competition for jobs, um, uh, people want to, uh, students who engage in programs and workers who engage and want to develop their skills want to learn knowledge which is highly applicable and the workplace can provide that and um, certainly in my country there's a very strong 
press on tertiary education, that is vocational education and higher education, to prepare students who are job ready. Um, and I think there's a distinction here between a traditional role of tertiary education to prepare people for occupations. And now what is being expected is that tertiary institutions will uh, prepare people to be job ready on graduation. And there's a clear difference between being prepared for an occupation and being prepared for a particular job. Not the least because we do not know where our graduates will find employment. So a very difficult role, but part of the expectations and teachers such as yourselves are interested in um, workplaces as being sites for applying and practicing what is taught. And then, as I've said, education institutions are concerned about uh, workplaces as sites for learning and making graduates job ready and students wanting to develop the kind of capacities that they will require for work. Hence, there's all of these concerns. And as the um, part of that concern is about people being um, competent or being employable across lengthening working lives, there's also a growing interest in in the workplace as a site for continuing education and training. And much of that is grounded in concerns that professional development programs that are only within um, tertiary education institutions often fail to um, meet the needs of uh, professional development and the requirements for ongoing development within a, a worker's um, working life. So there's these current interest in workplaces as learning environments. And even in countries which traditionally have not embraced workplace experiences as part of initial preparation, now that's increasingly the case. So just today I was um, communicating with a colleague, uh, Laurent Billiard from uh, Dijon, and was saying that in France, there's a, a strong move now, a change in perceptions that workplace experiences need to be part of, of, of programs preparing people for, for work. In terms of why focus on workplace learning, it would seem that workplaces potentially can be very useful places to initially develop and then further develop occupational practice across lengthening working lives. And also for many workers, the workplace is the only place where they can um, have those particular experiences because educational provisions, education institutions might not have the facilities for that. So here, for instance, in this image, you'll see that there's a worker in a particular plant using presumably particular equipment and there'll be particular sets of skills and knowledge required for that operation and the workplace is likely to be one of the few places where a, a worker can develop further those kind of skills. And importantly workplaces are sources of authentic experiences of work from which occupational capacities require. In um, oh, 1984, uh, Sylvia Scribner um, made the point that activity structures cognition. That is the things that we do shape our thinking and acting. So that the authenticity of work experiences is important because by engaging in authentic work activities, that's the way we learn the kind of skills we need to um, practice those occupations. And as I've already said, that workplaces are key sites for ongoing occupational development through working lives. Yes, some workers are able to leave workplaces and engage in, in programs of professional development, 
but many workers, particularly those workers who are in low paid and perhaps low status work, such as aged care, health, some of the uh, health care aids uh, work, production workers and process workers, often they're not able to be supported in their ongoing development by professional development programs outside of it, but rather that the workplace is the site through which they will be able to continue to develop their knowledge. And that skill shortages and workforce development imperatives are making workplaces essential sites for learning because the need to have workers with the correct skills and also those skills being directly related to empl employable and productive processes. So there seems to be these broad sets of reasons and many of your responses um, to those focus questions have addressed these issues here. I'll just pause for a moment in case anybody would like to um, ask questions and I can then I can stop sharing and take those questions just to see if there's any questions at this point. Any questions from? Should I proceed, Maybe, do you think? Stephen, it's, it's not a, the question, but uh, I was also interested in the, in the, for, in the focus questions on the, the forum. There was also um, some responses that um, um, identified a, a sort of debate um, between, I mean, referring to the tensions between productivity and, um, and workers uh, or, or tr um, productivity and learning or training. Uh, the question was, uh, are uh, companies or enterprises really interested in, in, in workers learning for, for workers themselves or is it for uh, produ productivity purposes? And so I think it's uh, interesting when we think about um, an interest from, um, from companies or, or, or workplace context, is it an interest in the benefit of workers or is it an interest in the benefit of the production system? So there was some also some more ideological uh, debates also uh, referred yeah. to in some of the responses. So, yes, and it's a good question and it was raised by, as you said, by a number of the um, respondents, the questions. And I mean, what we, I think what we can say is that there's shared interests across here, that workplaces want um, uh, skilled workers and workplaces become most interested in developing the skills when they're having difficulty securing that labor. So for instance, in times when there's a labor shortage, that's when um, workplaces are likely to be able to provide support for, for workers and be very keen to engage with them. So at the moment, apparently in Germany, um, a lot of young people are not electing to do apprenticeships and the, yet there's a big need for apprenticeships and, that, and technical skills. And colleague uh, Thomas Diesinger from, um, uh, from Constance University says that in Germany there is a war for apprentices um, amongst companies. So companies are actually competing with each other to secure apprentices and to provide them with good conditions and very, very good training. So I think there's the issues of supply and demand when there's a surplus of skilled labor, I think enterprises will be less interested in, um, in promoting the, the, the skills of their workforce. However, when there's a shortage of those workers, uh, those skills, um, obviously enterprises um, are going to be investing in, in that. Mm -hmm. For instance, uh, in a project I've got at the moment, um, looking at the impact of lifelong learning on people affected by COVID. One of the people I've interviewed is, uh, was previously a captain of a, a 777. And he was an international, a captain of an international flight uh, plane. And he was telling me that um, the company he worked for, which was a Chinese airline, he was saying that when the you know, international flights can recommence again, he will be um, there'll be an oversupply of pilots 
and he will be positioned quite badly within that for several reasons. Firstly, that he's not Chinese, and so he, will, he says that Chinese airlines will want to first to employ Chinese, and he said the same thing about Emirates. Emirates will want to employ Emirati. He also pointed out that, um, that as a person in his mid-50s, he's a, an older pilot, and that then the issues about investment in him as a pilot and issues around his employability as he gets older become a problem. So, you know, there are those kind of factors, but there's also very important factors for workers to engage, to contribute to the employability, their own employability and the viability of, of, of the workplace. And so I think there's a balance across these things and they play out in different ways in different times and currently we're going through some very difficult times in some sectors for instance mm -hmm. thank you n'hésitez pas à poser des questions à faire des remarques hein, si vous pouvez les faire en français aussi i have a question um when you talk about skills um I can imagine it's easier um, to learn in a workplace uh, environment and develop hard skills. But what about uh, the soft skills? And if you learn and develop soft skills in one uh, workplace environment, are they really uh, transferable in other working contexts? Yes, I mean, it's a very good question. Um, and often it's said that, you know, you, you, you learn, you know, particular things in workplaces. People often say that you learn concepts in education institutions and you learn procedural skills in the workplace. I don't think that's true. I think you learn both. Um, but in terms of um, what you're referring to as soft skills, which are often dispositional, What we know is that people learn dispositional skills and also the critique of them from observation um, of observing people in practice so that as people you know, come to practice something, people make judgments about how they go about it, the values that they use and how they go about it. And so in terms of learning, I think it's often those soft skills, which are seen to be the things that are best taught in education institutions are actually probably best learnt. And I think there's a big difference between teaching and learning in situations where you can see them being practiced. The key issue though, there is that when people learn in workplaces, um, what can happen is that people can learn bad practices, um, dangerous, Um, and perilous practices, for instance. And this has occurred in a few places in the healthcare sector. So for instance, in the North Staffordshire Trust in Britain, there was a hospital where there was a, I guess a culture of practice had occurred. And this is where patient care was, was being seen as being secondary to achieving outcomes of patient throughput. And this hospital had a statistically high level of patient mortality, that is patient deaths. And it was so high that it was actually, it stood out in the national statistics. And when they went and looked at the environment, at what they found was there was very bad practices going on. And these practices were being learned by people engaging in the hospital. So one of the important things is, and this is particularly important for a consideration of how we integrate educational and workplace experiences is to develop a critical perspective so that um, when we see things in practice, we say, is that good? Is that appropriate? Um, so we are aware of, of, of good um, um, positive enactment of, um, of, of what you're referring to as, as, as soft skills and, and where we, we see that they're inappropriate. And I'm doing work currently with um, a colleague looking at how patients with dementia and delirium 
are being treated in, in, um, in hospitals. <clears throat> and one of the things which sometimes happens is that patients like that <clears throat> are given high level sedatives so that they sleep a lot. But what we know is that when patients are given high level sedatives, they have a greater propensity to have falls, uh, fall, fall over. And what we know then is that patients who fall over have very bad outcomes in terms of morbidity and mortality. So that again, um, where a practice is bad, um, that can be learned through the workplace. And that in some sense is, is what I think you're also referring to as soft skills. And that's why we need a, a critical um, approach to learning in workplaces. And also um, in that particular instance, you need mechanisms to ensure patient safety. So I think a lot of the what's referred to as soft skills are learned through observation um, and imitation in the workplace through a process called mimetic learning. But what we have to be aware of is that, um, uh, that people can be exposed to bad practice as well as positive examples of practice. So that learning occurs, but what, what we obviously want to be sensitive to is good examples and so when those soft skills are learned. So in terms of your consideration of transfer, so that you have ideas about what constitutes patient safety or what constitutes safe practice or what constitutes quality work and you apply that um, in a reasoned way across different kinds of workplaces. I think that's the rough answer I would, I would propose, Lawrence. Thank you. Should I progress on to um, yes. talk? Okay, so as Laurent was saying, what I'd like to do now is talk about learning through work. And Laurent's already mentioned, there's an accompanying uh, resource here, which is um, a, a, a product of a research project, which has been translated into French. And I hope that's helpful for you. In that document, it's many of the concepts I'll be referring to are translated. And I understand the translation is, is helpful. And let me start somewhere. So um, learning through practice. Um, the important first point is that this has been the most common and sustained mode of learning occupations across human history. The simple point is that um, across human history, the vast, vast, vast majority of individuals learning um, occupational skills have done so through practice. Please remember it's only been in the last 150 years or so that we've had educational provisions for the majority of the population. And in most instances, even less period of time where we've had educational provisions specifically for um, occupations. But across most of human history, um, what has occurred really is that people have learned through practice. And this has been central to humanity and central to human progress, I argue. And that similar processes appear to have occurred in Europe, Asia, and likely elsewhere. And what's interesting in this image on the right-hand side here of the barber's shop, um, bears remarkable resemblance to the hairdressing salons that I investigated as part of my PhD. And processes that I can witness here such as the apprentice washing the hair away from the main cutting area and um, still play out today. And the division of labor we see here, including the barber doing the final cuts around the important, crucial cuts around the customer's head. And then we see processes here of, of, of making artifacts in China, for instance. And that it would seem that family and local workplace were sites for of learning um, in Europe, India, um, Japan, and China, up until um, industrialization in those countries. And so it was family-based occupational preparation, often learning within family, which meant that young people tended to learn the skills that were within that family um, and that's how the development of skills has progressed across 
most of humanity up until recent times. Yes, of course, there has been um, um, long-standing educational provisions, but they've only up until the last, you know, in, until um, modernity, the formation of modern nation states, industrialization, they were only available for a tiny, tiny, tiny majority of the population. And those people certainly weren't cutting people's hair or tending for those people as, as nursing or whatever. So they were mainly for an elite population. And so, the, and the vast majority of that learning appears to have been based on participation in occupational practices and that the, it was a learning process. It was not premised upon being taught. And much of it appears to be a process that's referred to as mimetic learning, which is observation, imitation, and practice. And the point, the important point here is, it is a learning process, not a process of teaching. Now, this really isn't surprising when you think about it, because if people hadn't been exposed to instruction, into teaching, um, they wouldn't use that processes in helping others to learn. And the anthropological literature provides very, very, very few examples of where there is direct instruction occurring between the more experienced worker and the less experienced worker. Much more the case is that people learn through practice. So some premises then that's, that's helpful for thinking about all of this is that there is no separation between participating in work and the process of learning. And so as we engage in our work activity, we engage in goal-directed activities, and it's through those activities then that change occurs, and that change is learning. As we do things, we, we, learn, we, we learn. And in doing so, we also engage in the process of remaking the practice that we engage in. So as we, as we engage in work, there's two legacies. The first is that we learn, and the second is that we engage in a process of remaking the occupational practice at a particular point in time, responding to particular issues. So just take, for example, what has occurred in the last six, seven, eight months in how people have gone about their work um, in response to you know, the, effect, the impact of coronavirus. For many workers, um, it's, it's changed the format and kind of work they do. And for many workers, for instance, there's been a change to working socially distanced and using this kind of technology. I've currently got a project looking at how um, general um, medical practice is occurring differently in rural um, Queensland. And here we're talking about very large distances. And so the use of telehealth, the use of uh, telephones, um, is being used by doctors in a way that's never occurred before. And we're seeing in those um, practices, those general practices, a change for all kinds of workers. The doctor's work has changed because they're working from telephones. The receptionist's work has changed because the receptionists now have to engage with patients, advise them about the process, and also engage in a process called triaging, which is give priorities and decide which patients need to be seen face to face by the doctor or which ones can be done through telehealth. The practice nurse has had to engage in a different way because of um, the, the um, issues of social distancing, etc. So as people engage in work activities, they, they learn, but they also remaking occupational practice, particularly in times such as currently ones of change. And that the knowledge that we need to learn doesn't come from within us. It's, it's a product of history, culture, and situation. And so we need to engage with that knowledge to learn it. And so the, the technical term for that is interpsychological. And that is we need to engage with knowledge which is out there and we need to find ways of accessing that knowledge and mediating that knowledge so that we can learn it. And it would seem that the richness of, of, of learning likely depends upon two things. Firstly, on the one hand, the kind and character of interactions and activities that people engage in, the things that people uh, participate in on the one hand, and on the other hand, 
how people come to engage in those activities. So on the one hand, you've got experiences that are provided and ultimately how people come to engage with it. Now, just going back to this idea of, of the lack of separation between um, engaging in work and learning. When we, when we do, when we engage in tasks we've done before, whether it's, you know, going to work um, or whatever, doing familiar tasks, driving a car or whatever, there's a learning dimension there because we're, we're actually reinforcing and refining and honing what we know uh, can do and value. So even routine tasks are an important element of learning through practice. So this hones and refines and reinforces what we do. And then when we do new things, that is generative of new knowledge. Sorry, it creates new knowledge. So work and learning then are very much um, co-occurring. And these two qualities down the bottom here, the kind of interactions and activities individuals are able to participate in on the one hand and how they engage in them is what I've referred to as affordances and um, an engagement. It's a duality, not a dualism. Sorry, that's a mistake. It's a, a, a duality between affordances and engagement. So in, in terms of um, um, uh, the material I'm about to present now, as I work through this material, what I'll ask you to do is think about it in terms of how what I'm going to be reporting relates to your work uh, and your workplace. And if you haven't got a, a, a job at this point, think about other people's work or work that you've done previously with which you're familiar. You might like also to think about what this means to your work as an adult and vocational educator or a human resource development practitioner. So try and apply these concepts to, to um, things that work, work situations with which you're familiar. Okay. So in terms of what studies um, that I did earlier indicated is that learning through everyday practice in the workplace, gener there's, there's four key contributions of that to learning um, learning through everyday work. The first one is engaging in work tasks. And when I first started out, I was, I was interviewing people like coal miners, and they were telling me that they just learn by just doing it. Uh, and what we know then, that is the legacy of engaging in goal-directed activities, and that when you engage in um, a, an activity, there's a legacy um, in terms of change, which is you learn from that activity. And again, going back to what um, um, uh, Scribner and um, Scribner said in, in 1984, and that is that activity structures cognition, the kind of things that you do and um, shape your cognition, shape your learning. We also know that um, a lot of learning arises from um, indirect guidance, from observation and listening. And again, as coal miners said to me, just being there, actually um, observing and listening and, and then imitating that. And then there's practice, the opportunity to, to practice, to rehearse and refine and associate concepts. And one of the things, qualities of workplace is often they provide the opportunity to practice and rehearse, which is simply not available in educational settings. Now, Years ago, what I used to do is I used to work in a vocational college and I used to teach students how to make something like this shirt I'm wearing. And I would teach them how to make this cuff or this collar or how to put this pocket on this shirt or how to make this placket front. And the students would do one of them and then they would like a little sample piece and put it in a plastic envelope what they really need to do was 20 or 30 of them to develop the skills so that they could do them in the future. You can't often have that experience in an educational setting, but the workplace provides that for you. And then the fourth one is the close guidance, the ability to be guided by 
um, other practitioners and individuals who are more expert. And they often can provide you with access to knowledge that cannot be learned through discovery. You know, there's concepts which are hidden and symbolic knowledge which is hard to access. And it's these experts then that um, are more experienced workers that can guide your learning um, through that. Now, these are these four concepts that four contributions to learning that arise through work and everyday activities. And I think it's worthwhile noticing that if you consider those four, you'll see that the first three are very much premised upon the actions of the learner. That it's the learner that largely mediates those three first forms of contributions. Nobody else can do that. The learner needs to engage and the learner needs to um, engage in observation, imitation, and the learner needs to engage in practice. And it's really only the fourth one where the learner is dependent upon a more expert partner. So this just emphasizes the importance of individuals' intentionality as learners, their agency, their interests, agency, etc., um, in engaging in that process. And um, many of these contributions are made interdependently. Um, they're actually about engaging with others and making sense of what others are doing. And that the usefulness of these forms of contributions are likely to differ at different points in the person's learning journey, learning trajectory. So they'll, be, they'll have different potency at different points of time when the person is engaged in learning. So let me just go through some of these, the, these quickly. So um, as I've said that, oh, sorry, I beg your pardon, it was Rogoff and Lave, 1984, I beg your pardon, activity structures cognition. And that is that the kind of engagement you do lead to particular activities. And what we know is then, as I've said, that when you engage in routine activities, familiar activities, this um, reinforces and refines and hones what you do. The process is technically referred to as proceduralization. And this is important because what happens is when you um, uh, practice things, these become, um, become compiled into what was referred to as specific procedures. So those of you who learned to drive may remember first of all, being very conscious about all the gears and the steering wheel and having to manage the road. But then some of those processes such as changing gears through practice become compiled into single procedures and you don't need to consciously think about them. And this is very important because the compilation of procedures allows you to perform routine tasks without consciously thinking about it. For instance, you don't have to think about how you walk um, because all of those processes are, um, are, are, are proceduralized. The same with driving a car. And once you become, um, once those processes have become proceduralized, you can give your full attention as a driver to the road and the tra other traffic. You're not focused on the, the, the actual specific procedures associated with, with driving the car. So this process of practice is very important because it hones and um, develops those skills. And anybody who has played a musical instrument or played um, sport knows the importance of developing those and, and compiling those procedures so that you don't have to consciously think about them. You can be thinking about other things and those procedures will progress. And this then leads to what is referred to as automatization, and that is those procedures can be enacted. Sometimes, um, of course, you can do, you know, things occur without thinking. Um, one of the problems I have when I go to a country where you drive on the other side of the road, such as in Europe is, that many of my procedures are associated with driving on my side of the road, not your side of the road. And so that can be dangerous when you assume certain things and you, you know, you, you um, cause your automatic procedures are taking you in a particular way and you have to consciously intervene to stop that doing that. However, when we engage in new activities, novel activities, this is generative of new knowledge structures and new categories of, of knowledge. 
And the great risk, of course, is that if you're asked to do too many new things, it, it, it can be too much and you can get dissonance. It can be too much, too much to learn from. So a progression of, of not having too many um, new activities can be helpful in the development of effective, um, sorry, effective learning. So here's some, here's some quotes, and these are from workers. Once you seem to know the area, you don't really seem to think about your work activities very much. You sort of just do it. You're always trying and you probably don't realize you did something, it just flows on. Um, the more you do it, it becomes second nature. And the only way you can get the pressure of the grinding right and get the knowledge of when everything's right, after a while with the grinding, you can just tell by the way your molds slide on the pad, whether it's ground enough. It's the only way you can learn this job. You can understand the job from the book, but work activities would be the only way you can learn it. It's all hands on. Now, what was interesting about this particular example is this was a worker who was working in a, a large um, pr a secondary processing plant that turns magnesite crystals, uh, magnesite ore into magnesite crystals. And magnesite crystals are used to line the in inside of jet engines, etc. And this worker actually had an injury. He had a bad back. And so he, he was put on light duties. And this required him to take samples from the furnace and then cut them through with a diamond saw and polish it and then count the number of crystals. And that was a, a, a way of telling whether the ore body was ready to be harvested. The point was a couple of things here was that by actually engaging in this task, <clears throat> he talks about getting the polishing right by feel. But there was, there was other things he learned was that by doing this task, he actually learned what was happening inside of this kiln that you can't go near because of the very excessive heat. So he gained insights into the actual production processes through, the, through his work. And there's probably no other way you could actually come to envisage what happens inside the, the, um, uh, the urn. And then the second one is indirect guidance provided by the work setting. And um, Bransford, for instance, refers to uh, the spectacular learning that children do between the age of zero and five. What he argues is that <clears throat> these processes give the skills children need to be successful in school. And this learning occurs through observation and imitation. And others suggest, by the way, that, um, that, um, that children learn far more vocabulary than they are actually taught. And so it's this process of observation and, and listening and imitation is how vocabulary is learned. <clears throat> and that anthropological studies report this process is, as being the way that much of the learning of cultural practice has always occurred, as I said earlier. And what is also suggested by a movement called ecological psychology, which was really the forerunner of what today is referred to as um, sociocultural psychology. Um, Barker referred to the way that the physical environment informs, it provides clues and cues to help people do their work. So in the image down the bottom here, there's a, a, a doctor, um, an image of a doctor providing some, um, a, um, some care to a patient and perhaps he's telling her some bad news. And you can see the way he's going about it. There's an arm on the shoulder. <clears throat> in one of the studies that around this, did around this time, it was in a warehouse. And we asked the warehouse um, staff about dealing with new tasks as well as existing tasks. And one of the questions they're asked is that when you have a new type of box to pack and to store in the warehouse, how do you work out how to do it? And one of these people who operates the forklift said, in the warehouse, the warehouse is a library of examples that we can draw upon to work out how best to handle that box and how to store that box. So the physical environment can be richly informative. It provides clues and cues which help us um, decide how we go about our, our work. 
I mean, just to give you another example, when I go to other countries, there's always that thing about whether you cross the road. Do you have to wait for the traffic lights to change or can you cross the road in this country? And of course, what you do is you look what the locals do and then decide whether you should wait for the traffic lights. When I'm on a train in a new country, what I always do is sit near the exit. And so I look at the way that people get on and off the train. Is it one of those trains that when the train stops, you need to press the button at the door or will the doors auto automatically open? So there is ways and clues and cues provided by the physical environment, which indicates how you should think and act. So here's a, um, some quotes. When Steve, that's not me, by the way, when Steve's talking to, any, to the other guys, I sort of listen in. I normally draw something on the board that's got to do with the multi-heart. I just look and listen whatever's going around. So this novice worker then is engaging in listening, but also trying to capture what the conversation's about by making a representation on the whiteboard. Another worker said, I'm always listening on to the two-way. The two-way is the communication system that the workers have in this plant. I'm always listening to what's going on and aha, um, they're solving a problem and um, listen to how, the, how they're solving the problem and actually go over and ask those workers about how they're, how they're engaging in solving that problem and you know, what problems were you facing and, and they tell him. So this was a worker who was actively seeking to learn about these skills and would listen to the conversations on the, the two-way system and then would go and interrogate the, um, the workers to find out how they were going. I might add this worker made himself unpopular because he would go up and interrupt these other workers lunchtime and say, what were you doing? Why didn't you do it this way? But he was a very, very active, um, agentic learner. And here in the control room, there's lots of talk going on about different kinds of things that are happening. Is that useful? I ask. Yeah, if you know what you're talking about, if you don't know, you just wait until they've finished talking and ask them what was this and what was that. So that's an, an, an example then of a, a worker who knows um, and listens to what's going on, but knows the time at which it's appropriate for him to go and seek further advice. And so much of what is described here is this process of observation and imitation, this process of mimesis or mimetic learning, which seems to be how humans have learned across much of human history before we had schools, before we had school societies, and, but we still use that process today. And then the importance of practice in the workplace, that what we know is that practice makes this process of proceduralization. And as I've said, when you, you, you rehearse something, it becomes compiled and it frees up the working memory to focus on other things. And what we know is that humans have fantastic memories, but we have relatively limited processing skills. And by proceduralizing things, that reduces the cognitive load that we have to use when engaging with tasks. It allows us to achieve things by proceduralizing things so we don't have to engage in conscious thought. And in terms of conceptual development, that the experiences provide links and associations between um, problems and solutions that, um, that develop understanding. And what we know is that deep understanding is not knowing lots of things. It's about understanding and the links and associations with concepts so that something over here will have an impact over here. So we need to take that into consideration and that's likely to have an impact here. So deep knowledge is not just having lots of it, it's understanding the associations amongst it. And whenever you're engaging with a doctor who's doing a diagnosis of, of, of your health condition, you'll see that they go through that. The questions they ask is directed towards a process of what's referred to as differential diagnosis, where they're seeking to cut out, to rule out things, rule in things, and then get down to what they believe is the 
um, to the problem, the health problem you have. And then, as I was saying before, um, in responding to Lawrence's question, the important dispositional development that, um, that we see from observing and this affirms and this nuances how we go about um, our, our work activity, which includes working with others as in the image here. And so here's an example from a, a medical setting. When I first started, the simplest job became the toughest job for me. So if, if I managed to get some bloods off a patient, bloods is taking bloods from a patient, I'll be very happy then. But I feel like I'm enjoying it now because I'm learning again. I like to learning when I learn, I see the patient. I practice it, I understand it and know the future. If, if it comes across the case, I have better knowledge, more confidence in managing the patient or dealing with it and compared with one year ago, which I had no confidence. But now I feel every day I'm learning and seeing patients and new cases and I feel excited. And this was a, a, a patient, a, a doctor who works in pediatrics with children. And one of the very difficult things that pediatric doctors do is take blood from a small child because the child screams and experiences great, great discomfort and the parents are distressed. So that what this doctor is talking about is having learned that skill of taking the blood, they now can move on and engage with the patient more fully and also the patient's um, parents. And then fourthly, this idea of close guidance of other workers. And here we know that um, this can be helpful for assisting knowledge which you simply won't learn on your own or else with great difficulty because this, you have to access this knowledge. And this avoids what is referred to as the epistemological adventures of Robinson Crusoe. So there's no need to invent things when the practices are already, effective practices are already known. And so one of the key claims, which I'm sure you've come across, is this idea of the zone of proximal development. And that is the claim is that when you work with some alongside somebody who knows more than you, that the scope of your learning is enhanced because of the person you're working with knows more and can, uh, that, and the, scope, the potential zone of your learning is actually enhanced. Uh, and that's that Vygotsky notion of the zone of proximal development. Now here, I'll just give you some quick examples from data from a, a project. This was in one workplace. And this was a workplace that had invested a lot of money in a number of instructional things called learning guides, computer-based learning videos, and also took a lot of people off to an action thinking seminar. And they were, I engaged these, um, these workers in interviews and asking them to talk about problems they'd encountered in the workplace and how they'd responded to those problems and what had helped them respond to those problems. And what you'll see in this table is that what they'd reported is that there was high levels of um, supporting. Five is very good and one is no good. And down here you'll see that it was the things such as um, everyday activities, observing and listening and other workers that were particularly helpful for their learning and reported at a higher level than those things which were intentionally instructional. Um, and in some ways there was, a, there was good reason why that was the case. But so here's a pattern from one work site of where workers are reporting how um, um, they learnt in response to problems that they identified that they had solved. And you'll see then that those areas there are most highly valued. Um, and those were less valued. This was interesting, by the way, an interesting situation to do research in because um, the workplace had invested a lot of money in the things which are highlighted in yellow. And the workplace didn't appreciate the fact that um, I found that it wasn't those things that were effective for their learning. Um, and certainly the training manager in this workplace was quite annoyed with the findings that I generated because they contradicted um, where he had been spending money. In a different um, kind of um, setting, uh, this was a series of, of, of 
different studies in different workplaces of how people have responded to problems, you see a similar pattern. And you'll see, and this is again, the, that the, the numbers down going down the columns where you have big numbers, that is where people have reported either four or five for that contribution supporting their learning. And you'll see that um, the ones that are most frequently reported are uh, everyday activities and observing and learning from others. They're the ones that are most um, um, frequently reported. These workplaces included a large, uh, a large food production company, a, a florist, a textile manufacturing company, um, a local government agency, and uh, a small business. And what, what came across this was that people reported the importance of learning through observing and learning others and learning through everyday activities in the workplace. Now, very similar findings have been reported in um, uh, the program for the International Assessment of Adult Competence. And this is this um, exercise undertaken by the OECD. And it's actually very useful. And if you're not familiar with it, I'd encourage you to become familiar with it. All of the data for the 35 countries is broadly freely accessible. And I was hoping to show you the Swiss data, but unfortunately this week, the OECD server has not allowed access to it. So I'm going to instead show you some data from um, other countries. And this includes the, the four countries from the Nordic countries, which I've done some work in from Denmark, Finland, Norway, and Sweden. And this is the first slide just shows you the responses to workers being asked the question, how often do you learn from coworkers and supervisors? That is guidance by others. And how often do you, um, uh, um, how often work involves learning by doing through performing job? How do you actually learn through your work? And what you'll see is here the people report in terms of every day, at least once a week, less than once a month. And here you'll see the, the way they report how they learn through their everyday work activities. Um, again, apologies that I can't show you the Swiss data. I just couldn't get access to it this week. But what you'll see from this is that um, you know, these workers, and these are face-to-face -face interviews, by the way, this isn't some online survey that the workers fill out. This is um, what, uh, these are all done through face-to-face -face interviews. And you'll see there's decent numbers of people here, um, is that more likely they report learning through their own efforts in the workplace than being supported by others. Um, and so the, the pattern is then that there's a lot of learning going on. Some of that is supported by others, but a lot of it is through their everyday activities as they engage in work related tasks. So these findings suggest then that workers from these countries report 52, 46, um, 61 and 52% learning from others. And then 52, 62, 65% and 62% and through their own efforts, at least weekly. And um, colleagues in those countries were very interested when this data was shown because they, they make comparisons um, amongst each other, uh, which is not what the data was intended for, but that's what tends to happen. But um, what, is in, what is noteworthy is that there's some, um, and so this, 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 this data, uh, covers all classes and kinds of workers. But one of the very interesting questions, or two of the very interesting questions within the PIAC survey is it asks people about solving their, solving problems in their workplace. So um, the question they asked is, um, one question is, how often do you solve problems that take between zero and five minutes to come up with a solution? And then that is that one there, which is routine problem solving. They're also then asked a question about, how often do you solve problems that take between five and 30 minutes to come up with the solution? And that I think is non-routine problem solving. And what um, is the case here, you can see that workers report engaging in these activities um, at least every day and at least weekly at a reasonable level of engagement. Now, the important point here is that Routine problem solving is, uh, leads to learning. And it's that kind of learning where you reinforce, refine, and hone what you know. 
Whereas non-routine problem solving is a generation of new knowledge. And it's also probably about innovations, remaking the work practice because you're doing something in a different way. And again, of these, um, uh, across these countries, there's figures here that you can pair across these countries. But the important point is that certainly non-routine problem solving requires higher order cognitive capacities, but leads to higher order learning outcomes. And when you do the analysis, and I've done it across many countries from this data, what is fascinating is that um, it is not the professions that report the highest level of non-routine problem solving. It's actually technical workers and technicians who actually report the highest level of engaging in non-routine activities. So while we have this hierarchy of occupations, what the data indicates that, I should mention that workers of all categories of work engage in non-routine and routine problem solving, but the most frequent level is consistently reported by technicians. Now, perhaps that's not surprising because part of their job is to solve problems, but it's, it's interesting in terms of the assumptions that are often made about categories of, of work. And then just to, to find, finish this section that it's important to remember that there are a whole pile of limitations of learning through work. I'm not here to promote learning in the workplace per se, um, because there are limitations and, sh and, and shortcomings to learning through work. Certainly, you can learn things which are inappropriate, and there can be great difficulty of getting access to the kinds of activities and guidance that, that you require to learn. And one of the problems is that sometimes in work practice, people don't know the goals that they're being directed towards because they're not made explicit and the people are, are unaware of them. And there can be a reluctance of experts to provide guidance. Um, and there's lots of examples of this where, um, particularly in, in tight employment situations that uh, workers are often concerned about passing their knowledge on to other workers, least they become displaced. They're the ones that um, you know, lose their jobs. And so experts in many instances can be reluctant to provide guidance because it will undermine their employability. I should add that the classic studies of workplace, the first classic studies of workplace learning were done in Japanese corporations. And in those corporations, the, um, the supervisors had the responsibility to ensure that all of the staff learnt at every opportunity. And when new tasks came along, it was their job to ensure that um, employees got the opportunity to engage in new tasks. However, in those workplaces, everything was based on seniority so that the supervisor could develop the skills of others without a fear of being displaced by the people that he or she had assisted learning. And when new things occur, there can be an absence of expert guidance. And I've seen a lot of this currently with the whole shift, for instance, to teaching online. And you know, people are learning as they're going along and the change has been so rapid that there, there are some experts out there, but the, the people are looking for and, and having to come up with their own solutions because um, the expert advice is not always available. And then developing understanding in the workplace because the knowledge that's required is not easily able to be accessed because you can't engage with it in, in some situations. And we're seeing a lot of that with responses to COVID that you know, it's, it's not apparent. And people, you know, first of all, thought that transmission was occurring on surfaces. And then, you know, now we understand that it's particles in the air, which is causing high levels of transmission, et cetera, et cetera. That's not to say it's not being passed on by surfaces, but there's also the use of face masks that's come in perhaps later than, than uh, uh, was, was is best because of a lack of understanding of the um, um, of, of water droplets. And then there can be reluctance of workers to participate. If workers aren't interested in engaging in a particular kind of learning, it just um, is unlikely to happen. So here's a couple of quotes. You are probably shown the quickest way to do the job, but not the correct way. They show you the shortcuts, not diverting why you are doing what you're doing, 
a diverter. Why are you diverting material and were too? Didn't understand what the job was all about. I just done a job. Not broad-based broad learning. Skills targeted to the job at hand only was not useful when attempting to deal with unusual situations and not effective, did not provide an overall understanding of the materials, subject matter, technical problems or matters, math matters, um, contaminations, etc. So there's some suggestions as limitations of learning through work. So perhaps this would be a good opportunity to stop and I'll be guided by Laurent and, and how we go here, but perhaps I can stop sharing and see if there's any um, queries that, um, or questions or clarifications that I can respond to. Yeah, thank you very much, Stephen, for this uh, very rich uh, uh, talk. What I suggest, because it's, uh, we started at half past eight and it's uh, now um, over 10 o'clock, so uh, I, I suggest that, that we take a short break now so that students can think about uh, questions or clarifications. And uh, after the break, we start with discussing and engaging with, uh, with what you presented in terms of clarifications and discussions. Because if we start now discussing, it will take yeah. time and I yeah. think you will, will need a break. And maybe it's good for students to, uh, to reflect about what you said and, and to come with some uh, suggestions or, or questions or comments. Is that okay for you? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So um, I suggest that we uh, meet again at half past 10. Uh, so this will yeah. be half past six for you, Stephen. Half past seven. Half past seven, yeah, sorry, uh, time flies. <laughs> uh, so we'll, we'll have a, a little bit that 20 minutes break. We meet again uh, in um, more or less uh, 20 minutes. And then we start with discussion and uh, we finish your talk and, 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 and move to activity one. Yeah. Okay. So if you want also to write uh, questions in the, uh, in the chat during the break, you're welcome to do so, or we can do it uh, orally after the break. Okay, so we'll okay. be back uh, in 20 minutes. Enjoy the break. Thank you. I putting the recording back. I hope you enjoyed your break um, and uh, had time to reflect on uh, Stephen's uh, presentation. And so we now have some substantial time for discussion. Um, hear your comments, your questions for clarifications or your subject of debate or disagreement. It might also be part of the discussion. Um, so I hope you are all back from the break. So. Who wants to bring something into the discussion or ask Stephen about some details or clarifications? The floor is yours. N'hésitez pas aussi si vous avez des questions en français, je peux les traduire. I had a question. Yes, Jessica. Um, when you talk about uh, workplace learning, do you talk about uh, only professional work or also voluntary work? How does the voluntary work, um, how do you talk about voluntary work when you talk about workplace learning? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah I must admit that most of my, um, most of the research I've done has been on paid work um, of all kinds, um, starting out with coal miners, secondary production workers, service workers, food production workers. Increasingly these days I'm involved with healthcare workers. Where I get close to volunteer <clears throat> workers is students. And um, I've done a number of projects on what in Australia is called work integrated learning. Um, and that'll be the subject of discussions tomorrow. And that is um, students spending time in the workplace in different ways. Sometimes they're in organized experiences such as nurses, doctors, teachers, etc. And sometimes they're more ad hoc arrangements. 
and obviously I've also um, so obviously but um, looked at apprenticeship learning where apprentices are in structured um, learning arrangements of course apprentices are paid um, for their work and a key difference between apprentices and students is that in my experience is that apprentices identify themselves as nascent workers um, nascent um, novice workers whereas um, students tend to identify themselves as um, students um, and there can be difference in terms of how they come to engage and and how that sense of self changes over time so the key to answer your, your, your question jessica um most of what i've done with volunteers has been people who are students and i know there's growing concerns about people doing internships which are not paid and seem to be getting longer but i haven't covered that field as much as i've done a lot of work though on university students who are engaged in paid part-time work was there a particular um point you wanted to explore so just to know whether in your view the voluntary work could be also considered as workplace learning or not oh yes yeah i mean exactly it's i mean i think we need to um uh, consider the qualities of the activities and whether they're authentic or not and with students for instance and volunteers i'll just put volunteers in that for a moment is that when volunteers are engaging in authentic work activities as far as i'm concerned that's very much work-based learning and uh, i did a project well probably 15 years ago where i focused on school students paid part-time work uh, I, don't, I can't speak for switzerland but in australia most school-aged children um, engage in significant amount of paid part-time work and at the same time in my state Queensland students have to go into a workplace for two days in in their year 11 and often that that work experience is is you know going to some workplace doing very peripheral tasks and my argument was that in terms of educational potential um, students engaged in paid part-time work was going to be far more authentic um, because you know they have to turn up they have to be punctual they have to perform tasks they have to you know do the right thing they have to work with others they get paid they have to join a union or might have to join a union they pay tax so um, my my view there was that <clears throat> There's an untapped potential in all of these students who are engaged in paid part-time work to use their experiences, to draw on their experiences to help school-aged children understand about the world of work beyond school. And in engaging with those students, one thing that came very apparent was that they were very critical and very um, perceptive about the kind of work they didn't want to do and they could actually identify um, jobs that they thought were worthwhile but also came to understand that some jobs weren't the kind of things they would aspire to and it just occurred to me that there's all of these students having all these authentic work experiences and they weren't being recognized and they weren't being utilized and of course one of the most important things that young people do is make decisions about their post-school pathways and here was a an opportunity the same thing, by the way, occurred, Jessica, in, um, in, um, um, in business courses. In Australia, we have very large numbers of students doing business courses, and it's very difficult to find workplace experiences for them. But again, um, my suggestion was that many of those students, nearly all of them, are engaged in paid part-time work. And they can analyze the work they do in terms of the kinds of things they're learning in their business course, you know, about the business, what it does, um, how it treats its employers, how it employees, how it manages them, all of those sorts of things. So to me, um, volunteers engaging in, um, in authentic work activities is very much, is very much um, I would say, you know, workplace learning.
Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know if that helps. Thank you very much. Maybe I just wanted to, um, to add something um, regarding voluntary work because there's been a interesting research conducted recently in Switzerland on, on that topic by two colleagues working at the Swiss Federal Institute for Vocational Education and Training in, in Lausanne, uh, Sandrine Cortesis and uh, Saskia Weber-Gizan. Um, Saskia did a master's program in adult education, so she knows the program quite well. And uh, they did a, a very nice research a couple of years ago about uh, voluntary work in Switzerland. And what they did uh, was to try to identify the sort of learning opportunities voluntary workers have when, for instance, engaging in holiday camps for children or of various sorts of uh, voluntary work. So they, they try to, to, um, to establish the existence of uh, uh, rich learning opportunities for voluntary workers that they can also use later in their training or in their work places. So it's, if you're interested by that topic, there is a book that has been um, edited last year, I think, uh, by these two authors. Uh, and that precisely addresses this topic of uh, the learning potential of voluntary work. Yeah. Merci. Any other questions or comments on Stephen's presentation? Uh, yeah, I had a question. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned in your presentation the hospital uh, in the UK, I think, where people would learn uh, bad practices through uh, observation and imitation. Um, nowadays, it's pretty rare to have uh, people who learn only through the field. So um, how is it that there wasn't any theoric um, learning that would prove them that th these practices weren't uh, safe in the hospital environment? I mean, it was a very, it was a very good question, by the way, and it was a subject of a massive inquiry in Britain. Um, and it would seem that what happened was, um, you can use the term a culture of practice um, arose that had a number of levels to it. Firstly, hospital systems being driven by managerial measures, um, and you know the the through the, the through flow of patients and the, the staff to patient ratio was being reduced because it was management of um, the healthcare system as being driven by management and financial imperatives rather than patient safety and care. So there was a culture that emerged and this just, I think, um, led to particular practices. Um, it led to um, a culture that wasn't caring of patients and patient safety to the degree that there were bad practices being enacted. So I think it evolved over time and uh, it was partly seen as being um, a, a problem of management, of the kind of imperatives that were driving the healthcare system, and also um, uh, other kinds of imperatives that um, were, were, were were practiced by practitioners. And you know, we can, there's been a number of these instances in healthcare. And one of the reasons that perhaps healthcare is prone to them is that it's very hierarchical. And it's very difficult for junior staff to raise concerns, for instance, about what senior doctors or senior clinicians do. Um, so it was a, a whole range of factors. But, the astonishing thing was that it was only discovered when um, people in London were comparing mortality and morbidity rates across um, healthcare, system, healthcare trusts, they call them in Britain, and saw this, this particular um, uh, hospital um, standing out. And so it caused an investigation and it was only when they went into it. it it's called the East Staffordshire Trust and um, the, uh, oh, what's the name? The guy who did the, um, oh, sorry, I forgot the name of the person who did it, but it's very easy to find on the web. And there's a number of articles been written about the way a particular culture uh, developed and was able to you know, be sustained over time. Yeah. I hope that answers your question, Matteo. Yes, it does. Thanks. Um, 
I have a more general um, comment and question. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, so, um, refer to the beginning of your presentation, you talked about interest in learning uh, in workplaces. And I also think that um, this interest um, and the role and place in society of learning in workplaces may also be shaped by cultural and social values that are associated with education in a specific country. Like you mentioned the um, example of Germany, it has a strong tradition of vocational education and training. And so the standing of learning workplace very high. But um, I'm doing research in Luxembourg and I consider or see it as, as different a bit. Um, there's a high premium in uh, on doing a baccalaureate and doing academic an academic educational pathway and um, for instance vocational education training is not called like that it's called vocational training so education has been like there is no education in the name so to say and so there's a divide in a sense between work and education or building and knowledge and um, like from my own field work um, in the vocational program one practitioner mentioned to me um, so she constructed the university climate as devoid of practical knowledge and hostile towards such knowledge. And so she would never consider to like participate in an exchange, so to say, because she, she said to me, she, she anticipates already the uh, negative remarks or the glances by the academic people and the students towards her and her students. So um, in a way she constructs this kind of um, uh, practical knowledge as being de devalued by um, yeah. by academia or by others. Um, yeah. So that's the, the comment and from my own field work and experience in, in Luxembourg and the question um, is a bit related to that. It concerns mimetic learning and from my observation from my own field work, some students thrive in such learning environments. They really pick up um, what's what matters in in such um, in, in in their respective jobs, um, but others are totally lost and they drop out of the program. So, do we need in our school systems right from the start to provide more opportunities to to learn mimetic learning or relearn it or reappreciate it? And if so, how could we do it? Um, what do you think? Yeah. Um, well, I'm, I'm sure I'm going to answer the, 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 the second one quickly first, mm -hmm. and then I'll go on to the first one. I suspect that in mimetic learning, I mean, any young person learns mimetically all the time, language, culture. I grew up in a, in a part of Britain where I had very long hair. It's hard to believe now, I was a hippie. And um, where I lived, there were lots of people with very short hair. They were called skinheads and they had very big shoes, boots, that they used to kick people like me. So as a young man, I learned something called street sense which was being safe on a street. And I know lots of women know that because they want to be safe on the street. So these are the things that mimetic learning is something that occurs, but I think mimetic learning occurs when people are given interesting things or important things for them to learn. So it's, it's likely to be the, um, um, the, the focus for their learning, what's of interest to them, what will engage them, which ultimately comes down to, to most of learning. I have to say, by the way, that. I, as a vocational educator, I worked for many years as a teacher in a vocational college, and the area I taught in was fashion um, and students making their own garments. I never had any problems with discipline. My biggest problem was getting the students out of the classroom at the end of a three hour session because they were so interested. So if we can find things that interest our students and are related to what they need to learn, I think lots of the issues are associated with that. Now. To your first question, it's huge. It's probably the single most issue that faces vocational education, and that is the standing of vocational education and the occupation it serves. And as you quite rightly point out, it's valued in different ways across different countries. And the kinds of knowledge that are associated with it are also often seen as being valued in different ways. Um, recently, I did um, a project for UNESCO um, well, a couple of projects for UNESCO. Um, one was looking at the development of um, what is called work-based learning in um, the Arab region countries, which were eight Arab, uh, sorry, eight countries in what used to be called the Middle East. 
And what was astounding there was the, um, how strong the societal sentiment about um, occupations that were served by vocational education. And um, for instance, I'll give you an example. The country of Egypt, which has about 100 million people, the, there was an arrangement between the previous German Chancellor, Kolm, and the previous president of uh, Egypt, Mubarak. It's called the Kolm Mubarak arrangement, a, a project. And they brought into, into Egypt 41 different types of German dual apprenticeship schemes. And they were engaged with by a total of 43,000 young people. Now, this is a country, by the way, of 100 million people, and a very high percentage of those are young people. 43,000 engaged with it. However, at the end of their apprenticeship, 71% of those people who completed the uh, apprenticeships left the, the field, and they used their apprenticeship qualification to articulate into higher education. But one feature of the Egyptian education employment nexus is that there's a direct inverted relationship between a level of qualification and your prospects of education. However, such, so the point there is the higher, the more qualifications you get, the less, the greater chance you stand of being unemployed. However, such was the um, prestige associated with getting higher qualifications that people pursued that path even though they've been trained in a, an apprenticeship, they left that apprenticeship to pursue higher education qualifications, even though it was um, leading nowhere. And it was interesting, um, across uh, five of those, no, six of those countries, the same pattern was, um, was repeated, including um, Palestine, where young people didn't want to do vocational education because it involved work. They wanted to go on to higher education totally understand people's aspirations, but it, it was working against um, the community and uh, people's needs. What was fascinating, by the way, is that the three countries where vocational education seemed to have the highest status were three ex-French ex colonial countries, which was Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia. And their vocational education had a relatively high status, and even apprenticeships um, is uh, contained within a chart, uh, so an annex of the Algerian uh, constitution that young people should have right to apprenticeships. The, sim the simple point is that um, we're living in an era of high aspiration of young people and their parents, and that many people um, see higher education as being the only worthwhile pathway, and that work that's associated with hands is seen to being dirty and um, unhelpful, unless, of course, you're a surgeon. Nobody has a problem um, with a surgeon doing that kind of work, which is very dirty very often, and it's using hands and using tools. So, yes, it's a real problem. It's probably the biggest problem for vocational education, and it plays out in different way, as you say, uh, culturally. So German in German culture, there's been a strong tradition of Beruf, um, the, the valuing of, of practical skills, which is absent in, in the Francophone world, largely because of, um, um, you know, apparently um, concerns about uh, within French republicanism that there's a, that often work is seen as being Eurasus and, um, um, sorry, um, not Eurasus, what's, what's an easy word, um, of being damaging and harmful for those who do it. So there's cultural um, uh, differences there. And then, um, it plays out in different ways in, in different countries. So we, yeah, sorry, I, I'm overstating the point, but it's a, it's a key issue and a very difficult one to address and all countries are trying to address it. I mean, Germany, for instance, they're trying to now put apprenticeships through universities to make them more dignified um, so that young people will be attracted to them. And, and of course, um, probably the best example that deals with this issue best is the Netherlands, because in Netherlands they have a very um, broad range of tertiary education institutions that go from um, the lower vocational college into a higher vocational education, into an applied university, and then into the academic university. 
And I think what Netherlands has, was it 23 million people living there? Um, they have, I think it's, oh, I'm trying to remember now, it's about 32 applied universities and only about a very small number of academic universities offer PhDs. So the Dutch system has a greater diversity of offerings, but they also have movement across them. So you can always move across, which seems to be very important. That's a very long answer. Any, any so other much. comments or questions? I do have one. Yes, Lord. Um, I, I just wondered what vocational education is because I cannot find a correct translation for that. Yeah, well, what I'd direct you towards is John Dewey, um, Education Democracy, Chapter 23, written in 1917. And read that. And it's, 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 uh, I think anybody to do vocational education should read that. Now, Dewey said there were two purposes for vocational education. Sorry, beg you be careful about that. Um, the first one is to help a person identify to what calling they are suited. Mm -hmm. And the second goal was to help people develop the capacities to enact that occupation. And I can't speak about the Swiss, Swiss system, but I know, I think in many systems, we don't do the first one well. We don't engage with people to identify to what occupation they are suited. Um, instead, the key focus is then on having people engage in developing the skills for the occupations. Now, in my life, you know, working life in vocational education, we used to have a program called pre-vocational and students could come in and they could sample different occupations carpentry, motor mechanics, electrical work, um, plumbing, uh, fitting and turning, and they'd decide which one they wanted and then seek an apprenticeship in it. Um, so that gave them some choice, but that was done away with a long time ago. So one of the problems then is, um, and it, it can be a problem that, for instance, in my country, over 50% of, um, of apprentices do not complete they fail, they fail to complete their apprenticeship. And unfortunately, it's tragic for young women because the vast majority of women in Australian vocational education system who are apprenticed are in hairdressing. And they dutifully complete their four year apprenticeship in hairdressing and then leave that occupation in very large numbers. The same is true for nursing, by the way, I should add. Um, and so this issue is profound, particularly for young women because it seems that both men, young men and young women make occupational choices at the time when they're forming gendered identities. And so many young women want to engage in occupations which they see as being associated with um, um, nurturing, caring, and young men seem to want to engage in other kinds of things associated with uh, male stereotypes. And what happens is when they engage in those activities, they find that they're not suited to them, just as Dewey said a, a long time ago. So um, a huge wastage in terms of personal time, personal investment, and also institutional investment. So that's a key problem. Hence, um, I think it's really worthwhile reading um, uh, chapter 23 of, um, of, of Dewey's um, Education Democracy. Um, it's it's a, a, a very good instruction. Not the easiest thing to read, by the way, but um, if you apply effort mode, um, it's something which um, you'll gain insights from. One of the key insights that I developed from reading that chapter and thinking about it is to make a distinction between occupations and vocations, and that occupations are um, are, are from the social world. They're an institutional fact. You know, we have hairdressers because there's a need for our hair to be dressed. And we have two types of hairdressers. We have barbers for men and hairdressers for women because for some reason the hair is different and different traditions associated with them. Um, but um, a vocation is a personal fact. Um, whether something becomes an individual's vocation um, is the important thing. So vocational education to come back to your question, should perhaps focus on ensuring a person identifies the occupation to which they are interested in, suited to, and ultimately it becomes their vocation, 
through engaging with it and identifying with it and come to see it as, the, as, as, as part of themselves, as it were. So that was one of the lessons that um, I learned from Dewey. Um, he didn't actually coin the term vocational education, but he's, he's certainly the person that set down um, um, much about it. And there's a long story behind that chapter, but I won't, I won't entertain that now. There is a question in the chat because uh, uh, students are interested to have the reference of the book you mentioned. So it's John Dewey and the title of the book is? Education and Democracy. Was it Democracy and Educa Education Democracy 1917? Yeah. 1917, Education yeah. and Democracy? Yeah. It's a book that has chapters on lots of things, but it, chapter 23 is the one on um, vocational education. Yeah. An astonishing, astonishing person, John Dewey. And uh, there is also another uh, comment in the, um, in the chat by uh, Christelle, uh, who mentions the, um, uh, there is a big event in Switzerland called the Swiss Skills, and that is a big event that tries to promote vocational education. Because I mean, this refers back to a Constance's discussion point about the standard and, and the recognition of vocational education. Yes. Uh, in comparison yeah. to other uh, educational pathway, and this uh, Swiss skills is um, a very big um, event um, yeah. in, in Switzerland that is also aiming at highlighting and, 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 and putting some uh, good, good values. Um, yes. Yeah. And uh, I mean, all, we, we see all these international uh, contests also where uh, apprentice, uh, apprentices are competing and you can, you can win the gold medal of the best carpenter in the world. And, and so yeah. this is a kind of international trend yes. towards um, um, yeah. sustaining and, uh, and, and bringing more visibility and recognition to the field of vocational education. By the way, just yes. to, to Maud's question, uh, I think in French we would say formation professionnelle for a, a, a quick translation oh. of vocational education. So it's a formation professionnelle initiale, it's the kind of entry to the a qualification uh, system uh, for, um, for uh, occupations. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the points that Dewey... Uh, oh, sorry. No, no, I just wanted to ask Christelle if she had some uh, other comments about the Swiss skills. No, I just uh, wanted to say that um, uh, La Constance, mm -hmm. um, um, my question is um, if there is a connection between the um, corporate culture or the environment um, from a country yeah, um, with the work, the, the workplace learning. Um, I've noticed the last 10 years is coming back to fashion in, in England, in France, and uh, here in Switzerland, it's um, in, in the, the German side, uh, is very, is widely uh, used. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the workplace learning, it's a very important um, concept. And um, I think it will develop the the in in a few years um, it will have a more important impact I think in in the in education. Yes, it's certainly developed into um, an important field, mm -hmm. and what I think is very important for it is that we do research on it, and we actually engage with it scientifically. Um, so it is seen as being a set of worthwhile experiences in its own right. And we have a language around it. And this is what I'll be talking about tomorrow in terms of practice pedagogies and practice curriculums, etc. And you'll be doing that this afternoon. Because um, it's really competing against well-established canons, as was said earlier, about the status of of conceptual knowledge, for instance, within higher education. So one of the reasons that I try and conceptualize it and, uh, and use terms that have both an educational heritage, but also have pertinence to um, uh, practice is that it needs a scientific lexicon so that it can be seen as being legitimate and important. And and also to break down some of the barriers that occur between things like teaching and learning 
the number of time I, I work in a faculty of education the main focus is on training people to be school teachers in primary and secondary school and the vast majority of my colleagues still can't get their head around the idea that learning can occur without teaching it's you know it's if if, if there's no teaching there's no learning um, and that is something which I deal with you know in my workplace because of very profound beliefs about the nexus between teaching and learning that comes from school societies such as those that we've grown up in um, and that's why it's important to try and break that and understand that uh, learning elsewhere a very good example of which, how you see this play out in policy terms is if you look at the vast majority of references to something called lifelong learning that comes from agencies such as the OECD or UNESCO, you'll actually find out that they're not about lifelong learning. They're about lifelong education. That is, they're about the provision of experiences, not about people's learning. And the discourse has got mixed up. And when people talk about lifelong learning, what they often talk about is courses where people attend, sit on seats and are told something. But of course, lifelong learning is something that occurs across our lives. And for adults, the vast, vast majority of that does not occur within educational programs and through educational institutions. It occurs in our family lives, our community lives and our work lives. So these definitional matters, I think, are very important. And unfortunately, once they get captured by agencies such as OECD, it's very difficult to change them. It's very difficult to get those concepts out of the, um, out of the policy discourse. And uh, we had a comment in the chat by uh, Patricia who said that um, uh, even in Switzerland, uh, you might have big differences between the German part and the Francophone part. And uh, for instance, the, this uh, Swiss skills, uh, you would never have, uh, almost never have a, a Francophone apprentice winning this contest because I mean, there was also a different uh, levels of skills uh, between apprentices depending on the, the region they live in. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Yeah. By the way, I think this, I mean, the Skill Olympic things, I think is a good idea to try and elevate the, um, the standing of vocational education. By the way, I just, um, for, um, I think it's for Constance um, interest, um, uh, I, I just edited a special issue of journal, uh, the Journal of Vocational Education and Training um, uh, in, in the beginning of this year on um, the standing of vocational education. And we had studies from Denmark, Norway, Israel, Spain, um, Australia, and um, Finland, different perspectives on that. And the, and the one that's most interesting and closest to what you were saying, Constance, is in Israel, there's been a move to try and separate out um, technical education from vocational education. Vocational education is seen as being something which is low grade and should be undertaken perhaps people from certain communities within Israel and technical education is something of higher order and should be treated as similarly so the way that these terms are used and so there's a paper in that from Israel on that particular issue <clears throat> okay other topics or object of concerns Maybe I just had a <clears throat> also a question or a discussion point um, uh, referring back to the the four um, the four different contributions to to workplace learning. So you mentioned engagement in work tasks, indirect guidance, practice within the setting, and close guidance. And at one at one point you mentioned that the the three first ones were uh, really in the hands of the learner, and the last one, close guidance, was very much in the hands of the environment. Yeah, I, I was I was uh, thinking about uh, to what extent uh, is the learner um, the only uh, factor in these three first uh, contributions? Because we, we we might also think that uh, there might be also um, contributions from the environment within the th oh yes three yeah. first yeah. ones yeah. yeah for instance uh, I, mean, I was really referring to the what what is privileged in the mediation of that mm -hmm. and that. 
the first three of those are actually dependent upon not on a teacher, mm -hmm. but on the active engagement of the learner with the physical and social environment. Um, so I'm not saying that the physical and social environment isn't important. I'm simply saying is that the locus of the mediation of the learning, the, the engagement um, with the experience is based on the agency and the actions of the learner. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is all part of this uh, issue that associated with, the, you know, the only good learning is when it's taught. Um, when you look, and it, 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 I didn't actually waken up at this for, for quite a few years, and I suddenly realized of the three of the first three were actually largely mediated by the individual. Because you can't get an individual to observe and listen unless they want to observe and listen in, in an active way. You can't get them to practice effectively unless they really want to do that. And it's really what they take from engagement in the goal-directed activity, which is, which is, you know, they mediate that. You, you can't do, force them into that. Mm -hmm. the, the, one of the concepts I find helpful here is the distinction between appropriation and mastery that was advanced by James Versch, which is W-E-R-T-S-C-H. And what he suggested was that Mastery was the superficial engagement in an activity because you were forced to, you were pressed to. Whereas appropriation is the active engagement in activity that, that, that because you wanted to, to learn. Um, Valsina was, grew up in Estonia when it was occupied by Russia. And he used the process of mastery to describe the way that the Estonian people would say with great enthusiasm that Russia didn't come and invade Estonia. They came to liberate Estonia, but they just happened to hang around a bit too long. Um, and so nobody believed the Russian line that they were there to liberate um, Estonia, that this was mastery, but appropriation was, they, they didn't believe that. I find that very helpful um, because a lot, of, a lot of what can happen in education is a process of mastery where students are directed towards trying to get passes in their courses, please the teacher, um, provide um, responses which they think their teachers want. And that can be mastery, whereas appropriation is a person's rich engagement and deep engagement with the content because they believe it is important. Now, having said that, um, you can get both positive and negative um, instances of um, mastery and appropriation. And as what we've just seen from America, an awful lot of people have appropriated the idea that this election that's just taken place was actually fraudulent. Um, and you can see that many people profoundly believe this. All the evidence suggests that's not true, but a lot of people have appropriated the idea that this is a fraud. Um, and so appropriation is not inherently a, a great thing, but what it refers to is a process by, by which you effortfully engage and you learn and you take things um, onto yourself. Um, and you know, it can be very important in learning an occupation, but they're also, you know, if people take on ideas which are unhelpful, um, or, you know, or wrong, um, that's where appropriation can play out. And of course, people who live in regimes, in countries with regimes where they have to do certain things in certain ways, may need to exercise mastery simply to survive and, and, to, and, and, and to exist. So for instance, I'm doing a study at the moment and um, some of the people I'm studying on their lifelong learning are people who fled countries from which um, they were treated very badly. And one of those people is a, a person who had to leave Iran and he grew up in a Baris community. And after the 1979 revolution, um, he was not allowed to work. He was not allowed to get his educational qualifications unless he converted to Muslim. Now he refused to do that, but he had to play along to a degree and then eventually had to flee the country. So lots of people have to engage in mastery situations when power, um, power is unequal, 
um, where circumstances mean they might have to do things in ways that um, they don't really want to, but they have to do. That doesn't necessarily mean they, they, they agree or accept those ideas. So I find, um, I find um, the concept of, of mastery and appropriation, which James Wersch um, uses or, or, or advanced, is helpful to understand those different processes that, that, that people engage in. Okay, thank you very much for these uh, clarifications and, uh, and compliments. Um, I suspect that we might move forward so that okay. you, can, um, you can finish your um, conceptual presentation for this morning session. All right, okay. This shouldn't take too long and um, I will just go to this slide now. Okay, so what I'd like to do just to finish this section off is just capture some conceptual conceptualizations of um, of what I've been talking, so that we move away from the specifics to the conceptualization of it. And so what I've put forward is this idea of co-participation, which is a duality of affordances and engagement. And um, affordances um, I describe as the invitational qualities of the workplace. That is the degree by which the workplace is inviting you to participate. Now that invitation can be good or bad, positive or negative. So for instance, in one situation, um, I'm aware of a, a student nurse went to a ward where she was gonna spend two weeks and her preceptor, that's the, the nurse who looks after her, said to her, well, I don't know what you're gonna be doing here for the next two weeks, but I'm not looking after you. So that's an affordance, but it's a negative affordance. On the other hand, um, I've come across many situations where novices have been welcomed and supported um, in their workplace. So the affordances can be positive or negative. But the idea of the affordances, it's what is afforded the person, what's provided for the person in terms of their support. And engagement is the degree by which individuals engage in what is afforded them. Now, um, I just mentioned something about this image down the bottom here. Uh, that image in the bottom there, and it, it refers to affordances and engagement, but it also allows me to just give another example of, um, of appropriation and mastery. That image is of a young woman in Singapore who has just completed her uh, uh, military training and is being given her weapon to work in the SAF, that's the Singapore um, Armed Forces. You can't see it from here, but there is tears in her eyes and behind her, the woman behind her is also um, has tears in her eyes. Now in Singapore, um, all young men have to do compulsory military service for about 18 months, similar to Switzerland. Um, however, women are not required to do that. However, some women elect to participate in, in training to be for the military. So um, there's no requirement, but th this particular woman and others decided to take that pathway. Now, when you see the pictures of the men who complete their compulsory military service, they're throwing their hats in the air and there's no tears in the eye because they're very keen to get out of it very quickly and get to the shopping malls and catch up with their friends. But, you know, so this is this appropriation and mastery where a young woman elects to do her military service and to become a soldier. And this is very, very important to her. This is not mastery, which would be the case for uh, the, the young men who are told they have to do the military service. This is dead serious. So that's another example of that. So um, there was a time, I think, when it was very difficult for women in the armed forces, and now it's getting easier. They're getting far more roles. And each of the contributions and limitations I've outlined earlier can be seen in terms of participatory practices, things that are afforded and bases of engagement. And what Laurent was just um, uh, asking me to elaborate on earlier with those four uh, contributions to learning have that within them, that experiences are afforded, um, opportunities to engage in work tasks, opportunities to practice, opportunities to interact with others.
but unless the worker takes up that, that offer, that invitation to engage with them, the learning perhaps won't be rich. So we need to think of this in terms of a duality. And workplaces are contested environments. That's one reason why I think myself and many others have shifted away from the community of practice concept because I've yet to really en encounter a workplace that's not contested. And the idea that um, a, a workplace culture is benign is outside of, of certainly my experience and it's outside of what my research said that workplaces are inherently contested in lots of different ways, not surprisingly. And at the moment in many workplaces I'm aware of, it's incredibly contested because of loss of jobs and competition for work. Um, here's a list of factors that came from an earlier study that I showed you some of the data from earlier about positive affordances in the workplace and, um, well, affordances in the workplace, and there's a list of them here, access to other workers, time to practice and learn, inclusion in knowledge sharing, discussion groups, access to knowledge, implementation of training programs, encouragement, attitudes of co-workers and opportunities to practice. And then other factors associated with engagement included asking questions, satisfaction with performance, improving performance through self-direction and self-interest. So this was work done, as you can see, back in 1998. And they were some, um, some examples then of affordances on the one hand and basis by which individuals engage on the other. And just finally, three little things. The first one is that I tend not to like the term informal learning um, because um, it, it's not helpful. People don't learn informally. There's no such, I think mean, it's a silly statement, but, but it's wrong to also see workplaces as informal learning environments because everything I see in workplace is highly formalized and structured. Um, how people progress, the kind of activities they're allowed to do are often highly formulated. In the coal mines that I first started doing research in um, close to 30 years ago, um, there were certain jobs which were highly valued and there was up to a 20 year waiting list to get access to those jobs. You know, that is highly formalized. There's also barriers around jobs because of, for instance, union affiliation, which didn't allow some people to get jobs because of their affiliations. And one of the other things is about informal learning is often seen as being leading to narrow learning, concrete learning, um, sh shallow learning, when in actual fact, rich learning arises from workplace experiences. The majority of the kind of um, learning that clinicians do, medical clinicians do, to be able to um, engage in differential diagnosis to understand your health problems arise from extensive instances of practice of diagnosing patients are coming up and identifying particular sets of factors that comes from practice. And the idea that there's a, an informal mode of cognition that's not rich and important is simply wrong because people engage in effortfully and problem solving uh, and using higher order capacities, as I've indicated from the PIAC data. And also to suggest that a workplace is an informal learning environment denies the contribution that comes from humans as they engage in physical and social environments. And so in terms of participatory practices, what I've suggested there is a combination of personal practices and also cultural and situational practices. And it's the interaction between the two. And it's this duality of affordances on the one hand and engagement on the other. And in many ways, this stuff will be person dependent. How the person comes to engage with what is afforded them um, will differ depending upon their interest, their readiness, their capacities, and their, their aspirations, where they, where they want to go. And so these factors will always be relational and the person is fairly central to that. Okay, so 
should, I, I should stop there and just see if there's any final questions and then I'll let Laurent take you into um, the activity. Okay, thank you, Stephen, for, for this uh, conceptual framework. So we, we still have time to discuss with you and to maybe raise other questions or comments. I do have a question. Yes, Fadi. Uh, it's for Mr. Billet. Hello, uh, just wanted to know if you can go back to your slide 26 about the, uh, the factors that encourage participation by workers, about the engagement. I'm just disturbed because I don't see the concept of self-efficacy. I don't know how it doesn't influence uh, engagement. Yeah, I think that's when I referred to as agents. Is, is that the one? Where is it? Um, so I'm just trying to find the PowerPoint, sorry. Um, can you see that? Yeah, yeah, I see. Which slide is it, uh, Fadi? 26. 26. Uh, okay. No, it's not. Sorry. I'm sorry. No, I've changed that. Sorry, it's this one down here. Yeah. Okay. So, um, this one here, is that the one? Yeah. On the right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you're quite right. But I've got self interest in there. Perhaps that should also be. Um, yeah, I've got self interest in there. So, it's, it could be self efficacy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I mean, this came from, these are responses from workers in the sites. They're the things that they told us. So they're the lists of things. So these are not concepts that come from academic literature. These are things that come from the, um, uh, the mouths and minds of the people that we interviewed in that project. But you're quite right. I mean, that's why, in, I think in the next slide, I refer to... Um, the importance of human agency um, in the learning process of, of the interest and the engagement, etc. Thank you. Does that help, Fadi? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions or clarifications? Okay. <clears throat> so, um, I have, sorry, sorry. I had, what, sorry, just one last Lawrence. Yeah. Yeah. Um, whose response, like um, past experiences, like uh, a worker who starts in a new company, has past experiences, knowledge. Who's responsible of um, dealing with the tensions that he can live with his past experiences, what he's learned in other situations, and what he's discovering and in, in, in learning in, this, in his current um, uh, workplace? Who's, who's responsible of, of dealing, of help, helping him and, and watching out for those tensions that can arise? Um, is is there also like a, a co co uh, participation? Like, is 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 the worker responsible? Is the expert responsible? Is somebody else responsible? I mean, who's yeah. how how do you deal with those? Uh, yeah. I mean, I mean, it's, yeah. The examples that come to my mind are um, when people come from other countries and have difficulty. Um, um, have difficulty sort of fitting in, as it were, and um, and um, th there can be problems when there's cultural dissonance uh, at one level. Um, you know, men coming from one culture, for instance, who are not used to women being in the workplace, and they're alone having a female boss. Um, that can be quite difficult. So. Um, that then is a combination of the person and also the organization seeking to um, 
um, address that issue. Um, obviously also if somebody has particular um, um, ways of doing things which are inconsistent with the practice of the workplace, that can also bring about tensions um, uh, within the workplace as well. And the, the person believes, for instance, that they know something better than what happens in the workplace. That might be true, it might be false, but it often causes tensions. And so I think there's, again, it's, it's got to be both ways. Um, the workplace seeking to accommodate, but the person um, also being open to saying um, that, that, that what I'm, you know, I, I need to sort of modify my views or whatever. So I think it's a, it's a shared responsibility. Um, it's, it, it, it obviously, in the case, in the examples I've used, and I'm thinking of some very specific examples, um, which would take too long to explain to you, but um, that it has to be uh, give and take um, on both sides. But if anything's associated with the care of children in, t in schools, patients in healthcare, aged people in aged care facilities, um, you've got to be very cautious. So for instance, um, um, in one study, which I've been involved in in Singapore, there was a problem that um, the aged care workers from the Philippines, um, they took upon themselves in the caring of older people, loco parentis. Um, that is, they took over the role of the, the guardian of that person and began doing things which um, should have, they should have sought consent from the next of kin. And that was their belief about how they should work, but it was inconsistent with contemporary models of aged care, that you don't make decisions, um, medical decisions and care decisions without consulting family, for instance. So I think in these situations, in that situation, for instance, they can't get Singaporeans to work in aged care facilities in Singapore, even though it has the third highest age population on the planet. Um, um, and, but um, they have to have people coming from other countries and those other countries may not share the cultural norms and values of that, of that country. So I think to answer your question, Laurent, I think it's, a, um, it's obviously reciprocal, but if we're talking about the safety of, of children, of, of patients, of elderly people, obviously the norms and practices which are accepted um, must, um, I think, be foremost in terms of a set of considerations. Is that what your is that what your question where your question yeah, is heading? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. It's just the the responsibility. I mean, the, the expert also has to be aware of those tensions that can. Yes. And I yeah. mean, not all experts are aware of those of those um, of that reality. Yeah. So, but yeah. Yes. And, 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 yeah. Your point is well made. This um, study where I did with a um, uh, a man who came from Kenya, and he was. He did his PhD with me on the the um, the, the, the difficulties that um, migrants from East Africa had in settling in Australia, um, and many of them had faced trauma, had faced you know murder, had seen murder, had seen their families murdered, and uh, that their teachers in the vocational college just simply couldn't comprehend the world that these students came from, but weren't particularly open to accommodating their difference and just saw them as being troublemakers um, and were perhaps insensitive. But it's not surprising in some sense they're insensitive because they couldn't understand, but there hadn't been an appropriate process whereby um, those teachers had been made aware of the needs of, the, the, the kind of experiences that refugee migrant students had gone through, particularly from, from that particular area. Yeah. So it's probably a collective responsibility to answer your question. Great, thanks. Any other questions or comments? Or in French, si vous avez aussi des questions en français, n'hésitez pas. Oh. 
Okay. So if there is no further questions, I think uh, we will move forward uh, with the program. I will, I will briefly present uh, the students' uh, activity number one for this afternoon, so before the, the break. And so maybe we can uh, say good night to Stephen <laughs> for today because it's, uh, it's quite late in, uh, in Brisbane. So thanks for having been with us until what, what time is it? It's half past eight. Yes, half past eight. Yeah, it's been a big day here. My daughter um, got her final grades for her master's dissertation. Okay. So she finished her master's dissertation, did very well. Mm -hmm. And then just got a job in Canberra. And today she organized accommodation in Canberra. So um, um, I will have a celebratory drink with my wife um, in, in a few minutes, I think. Yeah. Okay, great. This is, this is a good... So, uh... anyway, thank you very much for engaging this evening. This is kind of weird. Um, and I, much, I would really like to be in the same space as you, but that can't happen. And um, hopefully the video, the next session is okay. And then tomorrow we'll be able to catch up with any um, recaps or any other issues you want um, elaborated. And then tomorrow we'll, we'll look at some practices about en enhancing learning in the workplace. And then this issue of integrating workplace and educational experiences. So um, that's, that's the plan. But I'll leave you in Laurent's very capable hands and uh, uh, have a good rest of the day. Okay? okay? All the best. Okay, see you. Bye-bye. Bye bye, Stephen. Thank you. Bye. bye. Thank you. Good evening. Bye. 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 Good evening. Au revoir. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Merci beaucoup pour uh, cette session. J'espère que ça ça a été au niveau de la la compréhension. Mais apparemment, vous avez enfin uh, comme d'habitude les les gens qui s'expriment uh, c'est pas c'est pas c'est pas la, la totalité mais je enfin j'espère que c'était compréhensible pour uh, pour vous si jamais il y a des des questions de compréhension qui qui restent difficiles n'hésitez pas aussi à me à me solliciter uh, ce que je voulais juste uh, peut-être faire avant de de nous donner la la pause de midi c'est vous présenter un peu euh, l'activité numéro un. C'est l'activité qui va nous occuper pour la, la première partie de, de cet après-midi et pour laquelle vous pourrez faire peut-être un petit travail individuel préparatoire euh, avant, de, avant de prendre votre, euh, votre repas. Donc, euh, je vais partager mon écran et je vais vous présenter euh, l'activité numéro un qui se trouve donc sur euh, la fiche d'activité. Donc, je suis ici sur le document que vous trouvez sur Moodle, qui s'appelle euh, Task Sheet et, ou euh, Fiche d'activité. Et donc, euh, cet après-midi, euh, on, on, on fera la même chose pour tous les, les chapitres. On va mettre un peu en pratique les apports conceptuels du, du chapitre par rapport à vos situations euh, personnelles, les situations avec lesquelles vous avez une expérience. Et donc, euh, la, pro, le, la première activité, elle s'appelle euh, « Analyser les situations de travail que vous connaissez bien en lui appliquant le cadre concept, con, conceptuel du workplace learning ». Donc, l'idée ici, c'est que vous allez euh, identifier un peu une situation pratique de référence, euh, une situation de travail que vous connaissez bien. Euh, ça peut être, par exemple… Euh, la situation professionnelle, parce que certains d'entre vous, vous êtes des professionnels en cours d'emploi. Ça peut être une situation de travail bénévole, comme Jessica thématisait cette, cette question-là. Donc, ça peut être aussi du, du travail bénévole ou ça peut être un job d'étudiant que vous avez fait ou que vous êtes en train de faire. Ça peut être aussi une situation de stage que vous avez faite ou que vous êtes en train d'effectuer de, dans le cadre de votre master. Donc, vous allez devoir identifier une situation de travail qui va être un peu la situation de référence que vous allez traiter non seulement aujourd'hui, mais aussi demain. Donc, c'est important de bien la choisir parce que vous allez en quelque sorte étudier, ce, ce, faire une étude de cas sur, sur votre situation et vous allez l'enrichir à, à travers les différents apports conceptuels de, de ce séminaire. Donc, ce qui vous est demandé dans la première dans la première partie de cette tâche, c'est d'identifier une situation de travail avec laquelle vous êtes familier. Donc, vous allez devoir réfléchir à quelle situation. Et comme je vous le disais, ça peut être une situation 
très variés en, en fonction de votre statut professionnel et étudiantin. Vous avez tous déjà, je pense, eu une expérience professionnelle, donc vous allez penser à une situation et vous allez la, la décrire euh, brièvement euh, ici. Ensuite, la deuxième question qui vous est posée, c'est les potentialités et les limites de la situation de travail, quels apprentissages peuvent être effectués et par quels moyens Donc, par rapport à cette situation de référence, vous allez devoir vous poser la question de savoir comment vous l'avez apprise et quels ont été peut-être les, les facteurs facilitants ou les obstacles que vous avez, vous avez rencontrés dans l'apprentissage de cette situation. Donc, que ce soit un job d'étudiant, que ce soit votre activité professionnelle. Donc, peut-être là, il faudra penser concrètement des tâches ou des situations dans ces situations de travail dans lesquels vous avez été euh, confronté à des apprentissages. Et euh, il faut réfléchir quelles ont été les opportunités ou les limites dans l'apprentissage de cette activité-là. Et donc là, vous avez en page 2 euh, un espèce de tableau qui peut faciliter ce travail diagnostique sur qu'est-ce que vous avez appris dans cette situation de travail, à la fois en termes de contribution, c'est-à-dire vous avez ici les quatre grandes contributions que Stephen Millet a présentées, J'essaie juste de trouver un écran où je peux mieux montrer ça. Euh, C'est-à-dire le engagement in work tasks, indirect guidance, practice uh, within that setting et close guidance, qui sont les quatre grandes contributions qu'il a présentées dans son exposé. Et puis aussi les, uh, les limites ou les obstacles hein, qu'il a mentionnés brièvement. Donc les apprentissages inappropriés, l'accès limité à les activités d'accompagnement la non-compréhension des buts, la résistance des experts accompagnés, etc. etc. Donc ça, ça, ça revient à ces différentes limites qu'il a présentées. Bon, L'idée, c'est que vous fassiez un petit peu un, un diagnostic de qu'est-ce qui a été euh, peut-être facilité dans les apprentissages, comment vous les avez appris, et puis quelles ont été les limites ou les obstacles qui se sont posés euh, au moment où vous avez dû apprendre à faire le travail que vous avez euh, identifié comme votre situation de, de référence. Donc l'idée, c'est que euh, vous puissiez faire d'abord un travail individuel à partir de ce document, de réfléchir à une situation et d'en faire le diagnostic. Et ça, je pense que ce serait bien de le faire euh, avant midi. Donc on va s'arrêter dans, dans deux minutes, mais peut-être avoir un moment de réflexion euh, personnelle. Et puis à 13h30, on va se retrouver euh, pour la, la session d'après-midi. Et à ce moment-là, je vais vous diviser en cinq groupes. Donc vous serez, vous serez composé en groupe de cinq, cinq ou six personnes. Et ce que je vous proposerai à ce moment-là, c'est de partager un peu vos situations. C'est-à-dire, à partir de votre diagnostic personnel, vous allez échanger dans le groupe sur vos situations réciproques. Donc, vous aurez un moment de travail en sous-groupe. Et puis ensuite, on se retrouvera en plénière pour mettre en commun ce que chaque groupe aura peut-être identifié. Donc, quelques éléments de synthèse de chaque groupe. Et puis ensuite, on passera au chapitre numéro 2, qui sera basé sur la question du curriculum de la pratique. Est-ce que vous avez des questions par rapport à cette, à cette tâche C'est plus ou moins clair Donc l'idée, c'est vraiment de, de réfléchir à une étude de cas qui vous concerne et puis d'identifier quels ont été les apprentissages, comment vous les avez faits et puis quels ont été les éléments facilitants ou les, les difficultés. Euh, moi, j'ai juste une question. Oui, Jeanne. Euh, si c'est possible de prendre une situation où c'est qu'on est nous formateurs avec des apprenants mais euh... et puis qu'on a, qu a, voilà, qu a vécu des choses qu'on a appris vraiment sur le terrain c'est quelque chose qu'on pourrait ça, ça pourrait convenir tout à fait je pense que bah, le, on va dire le, le travail du formateur est aussi une situation de travail donc vous n'êtes pas obligé d'être vous dans la position de l'apprenant et et je pense que même dans la situation que vous, à laquelle vous pensez, vous, vous allez peut-être aussi questionner vos apprentissages euh, en tant que formateur. Donc, vous pourriez être soit dans la position de, de l'apprenant euh, novice ou bien aussi dans la position du formateur par rapport à votre situation de référence. Ça n'a pas nécessairement besoin d'être une situation de, de travail insérée dans un dispositif formel. Hein, ça n'a pas besoin d'être, par exemple... Euh, un apprentissage en alternance ou euh, une expérience de stage dans un cursus formel. Ça peut être aussi euh, un, un travail, euh, comme je disais, un, un, un job d'été ou des, euh, des activités qui n'ont pas nécessairement donné lieu à un cursus formalisé d'apprentissage. Moi, j'ai une question. 
Oui. Non, Axel. Axel, oui. <rire> Pardon. Oui, je, je confonds les chevriers, désolé. Non, mais c'est normal, j'ai dû installer Zoom en catastrophe tout à l'heure. D'accord. <rire> Donc, euh, il m'a proposé un nom, j'ai mis ça. D'accord. Euh, c'est juste pour la... la comment comment est-ce qu'on on, on fait Enfin, c'est-à-dire, est-ce qu'on on va directement sur Moodle et on remplit Ou est-ce qu'on fait à, à l'extérieur sur du... Enfin, moi, sur du papier moi. Alors, ce que je vous suggère, ça c'est une bonne question, c'est que vous, vous, vous téléchargez le document Word. Okay. Donc, le, le task sheet, c'est un document Word. D'accord. Et donc, vous pouvez déjà écrire du texte là-dedans. Dessus, ok. Et puis, ouais, vous dedans. le gardez pour vous. Vous n'avez pas besoin de le, de le, de le mettre sur le forum. Vous le gardez pour vous et ce sera votre document de référence. Ok, d'accord. Ça, c'est une bonne idée. Merci beaucoup. Ouais. Patricia Je me pose la question. Est-ce qu'il vaut mieux prendre une situation vraiment qu'on connaît bien ou bien est-ce qu'on peut prendre une situation euh, pas fictive, mais qui pourrait être, euh, par exemple, quelqu'un qui s'engagerait dans un stage et puis c'est au début de son engagement dans, ou dans une, un, un travail, euh, mais finalement, les, ben, les apprentissages, ils n'ont pas encore vraiment eu lieu. Alors, qu'est-ce qu'il vaut mieux, mieux faire ben, Je pense que c'est mieux que vous preniez une situation que vous connaissez bien. Euh... Parce que ben, des situations fictives, on peut en avoir plein, mais l'idée, c'est de, de pouvoir aussi euh, revenir sur votre propre expérience. Euh, donc, moi, je privilégierais quand même une situation à laquelle vous avez été confronté, vous, en tant qu'apprenant ou formateur ou, euh, ou simplement professionnel. Donc, je, je, je privilégierais plutôt cette piste-là. Euh... Donc là, pour ce, mat pour, euh, ce matin, pour 13h30, il faudrait qu'on ait idéalement fait. Je n'ai pas entendu. Euh... Voilà, ça serait coupé, pour... vous pouvez juste reformuler. Pardon. Pour 13h30, il faudrait qu'on ait fait la première page de la fiche d'activité ou aussi la deuxième Alors, disons que. Ce qui, ce qui serait bien, c'est que pour 13h30, vous ayez peut-être déjà réfléchi à ça. Vous n'avez pas besoin de forcément d'avoir écrit ou rempli l'affiche. Euh, mais que vous ayez euh, réfléchi à une situation, peut-être commencé à faire un peu des, des raisonnements diagnostiques, puis que vous puissiez en discuter entre, entre vous. Mais vous n'avez pas besoin d'avoir vraiment formellement euh, rempli la, la fiche, mais peut-être commencer à réfléchir personnellement à quelle va être votre situation et puis euh, quelles pourraient être les, les, les contributions ou les obstacles que vous avez rencontrés. C'est plus un processus de réflexion que je vous demanderai de faire jusqu'à 13h30. Peut-être que vous pourrez aussi prendre un petit moment au début du travail de sous-groupe. Ça dépend si dans le sous-groupe, vous avez tous pu déjà réfléchir. Vous pourrez partager tout de suite. S'il y en a qui ont besoin de temps, vous pourrez vous donner un petit moment de travail individuel. Et comme ça, je vous donne la tâche déjà. Vous avez, comme ça, vous pourrez y réfléchir un peu pendant la pause de midi. Merci. OK des, des questions encore Très bien. Alors, si on n'a pas, ce que je vais faire, c'est qu'on ben, va, on va s'arrêter là pour euh, ce matin. Vous pouvez euh, soit rester euh, connecté en coupant vos, euh, vos micros et, et caméras, soit vous pouvez sortir. Moi, je vais laisser la session euh, ouverte. Euh, c'est important de se retrouver tous à 13h30 précise parce que c'est à ce moment-là que je vais vous distribuer en groupe. Et même si euh, je, on peut encore vous distribuer dans les groupes, si vous arrivez en retard, ce sera plus facile si vous êtes tous là à 13h30. Et puis, euh, voilà, je vous souhaite bon appétit. OK Merci, pareillement. Merci, pareillement. Merci, pareillement. Bon appétit. Voilà. Je le fais tout de suite. Voilà. Je relance l'enregistrement, le, j'avais oublié de le faire. Euh, mais juste pour revenir sur l'enregistrement du, du chat, il génère un fichier texte, je crois. Hein. C'est-à-dire que l'enregistrement vidéo ne va pas garder les, le, le chat. Par contre, il génère oui. un, un fichier texte. C'est ça. Euh, je pourrais, euh, en effet, euh, aussi mettre à disposition le fichier, le fichier texte. Mais en général, si on a le lien pour l'enregistrement le, Zoom, euh, on peut télécharger les trois fichiers. Et dans les trois fichiers, il y a le fichier euh, de texte. Oui. Oui, sauf que là, je suis en train de faire un enregistrement sur mon ordinateur. Je ne le fais pas sur le serveur. Ah, OK. Et du coup, mais je pourrais vous faire le lien vers les trois fichiers parce que Zoom génère les mêmes trois fichiers, mm -hmm. même si c'est un stockage local. OK.
Donc, on a élucidé euh, cette question-là. Euh, donc, comme je vous l'avais annoncé ce matin, donc, euh, cet après-midi, on, on va travailler en, en différentes phases. Mais la première, ça va être un travail de groupe autour de l'activité numéro 1. Donc, on a discuté de la consigne avant le, la pause de, de midi. Est-ce que vous aviez encore des, des questions de compréhension par rapport, à la, par rapport aux questions qui sont sur la, la feuille d'activité Donc, ce qui vous est demandé, c'est en effet d'identifier une situation de travail et de réfléchir à quelles ont été les, euh, les opportunités d'apprentissage ou les difficultés rencontrées. Donc, de faire une analyse un peu euh, des apprentissages en lien avec ce, cette situation de travail, avec les outils que euh, Bilette vous a présentés euh, ce matin. Alors, ce que je vous propose, c'est qu'on va se, se donner un temps quand même assez confortable de travailler en sous-groupe. Vous allez être dans les sous-groupes de, de cinq ou six personnes. Donc, euh, je vous propose qu'on va se retrouver en plénière à 14 heures. Donc, euh, 14h30, excusez-moi, donc euh, on aura une, presque une heure de travail en, en sous-groupe. Et puis, ce qui vous permettra de, de partager à propos de vos situations de référence, j'espère que vous avez pu réfléchir un peu à, à une situation d'expérience professionnelle que vous avez rencontrée, et puis euh, que vous, vous pourrez l'analyser un peu à chaud, comme ça, sur, euh, sur ces catégories. Donc, organisez peut-être un tournus à l'intérieur du groupe, vous avez une dizaine de minutes chacun pour vous présenter vos situations. Peut-être que vous n'aurez pas le temps de passer en revue les cinq ou six cas, mais peut-être si vous en faites trois ou quatre, c'est pas mal. Vous pourrez toujours changer après dans les autres travaux de groupe. Vous allez rester donc avec les mêmes personnes du même groupe pendant les deux jours. Donc les groupes vont rester stables. Donc vous pourrez après aussi gagner du temps en n'ayant pas besoin de vous rappeler à chaque fois des situations que vous allez partager. Je vous demanderai peut-être aussi d'identifier dans chaque sous-groupe un porte-parole, enfin, quelqu'un qui pourra restituer en plénière. Donc à 14h30, on se retrouvera en plénière et puis on fera une petite restitution rapide de ce qui s'est dit dans les groupes. Donc peut-être identifier une personne parmi vous qui va faire ressortir les points de débat ou les points particulièrement intéressants que vous aimeriez partager avec le grand groupe au moment de la plénière. Ok Autrement, Aïla et moi, on va se, se balader dans les sous-groupes. Donc, si vous avez des questions, vous pouvez soit attendre qu'on passe. Donc, euh, Aïla va s'occuper du groupe 1 et 2 et moi des groupes 3, 4 et 5. Je crois que vous avez aussi la possibilité de, de demander de l'aide depuis les sous-groupes. Je n'ai jamais utilisé ces outils, mais j'ai vu passer ces choses. Donc, si jamais vous avez une question, vous pouvez euh, écrire et normalement, on devrait en être informé et puis venir euh, y répondre. OK euh, voilà, donc moi je vais vous distribuer dans cinq groupes, ça risque de prendre peut-être une ou deux minutes. Donc vous allez progressivement disparaître de la salle plénière, puis vous allez réapparaître dans d'autres salles. Euh, on se retrouve donc à 14h30, euh, et puis l'idée c'est à 14h30 de passer une trentaine de minutes à, à faire un peu le bilan de cette activité, de ce qui s'est dit dans les sous-groupes par rapport à cette activité-là. Ok est-ce que vous avez encore des, des questions Non. Non Alors bon, on se retrouve dans les, dans les sous-groupes. Et puis, euh, je vous souhaite euh, bon travail. Et je vous retrouve donc à, à 14h30 dans cette euh, configuration. Merci. OK. Alors, on va commencer le travail de, euh, de distribution. Alors, ça prend un peu de temps.
Voilà, vous devez normalement, voilà, vous pouvez rejoindre vos salles. Voilà. Donc là, ils ont tous été attribués. Oui. Euh, non, moi, je ne vois pas les groupes. OK. Euh, toi, tu ne vois pas les groupes. Peut-être parce que je n'ai pas les droits de... Ah oui, je ne t'ai pas donné les droits d'animation. Excuse-moi. OK. Par contre, euh, je vois pas. Ok, tarif. Parce que là, tu es marqué non affecté. Euh, Peut-être qu'il faut attendre un moment, je vais juste fermer ça. Euh, je vais t'envoyer dans un. Je t'envoie dans le groupe numéro 1. Ok, et, et puis, puis après je peux sortir. De, de ressortir et de revenir, puis voir si éventuellement ça active. Ok. Donc là, tu peux rejoindre le groupe numéro 1. Très bien. Ok. Est-ce que du coup, tu arrives à accéder aux, aux divisions en groupe Alors oui, là, oui. Ah non. Euh... Donc, tu arrives à rejoindre les groupes Alors, euh, je, je vois diviser en groupe et quand je vais diviser en groupe, je, il y a une fenêtre qui m'apparaît et dit « Vous avez été affecté euh, au groupe 1. » Et après, il me dit « Rejoindre la, la salle de conférence. » Ok, mais tu n'as pas d'autres fonctions non. Ah, c'est bizarre. Euh, donc toi, tu peux pas. Euh, 
tu ne peux pas choisir toi-même tes salles. Au fait, c'est moi qui dois te... Ok. Oui. Et ouais. Donc, moi, je peux t'envoyer dans, dans le groupe 2. D'accord. Par contre, du coup, je ne peux pas savoir qui est dans quel groupe à part si quand je suis dans le groupe. Oui, ce que je vais essayer de faire, c'est que je vais faire une, une capture d'écran. Ouais. Okay. Je vais t'envoyer par, par email. Parfait. Je t'ai envoyé. Merci. Ah oui, voilà. Et du coup, je vais aussi l'imprimer. Comme ça, on l'a les deux. Oui. Que tu pourrais, s'il te plaît, mon je imprimer aussi. Les feuilles aussi. Oui, parce qu'avec un vide, là, il faut une carte. Oui, voilà, c'est ça. <rire> J'arrive. Ah, maintenant, il y a, il y a cinq groupes. Il, il manque un... Oui, merci beaucoup. Je viens de remarquer que j'étais en train de boucher le nez sans le filmer et que j'ai enregistré en boucle encore une fois. Ah, faut que j'arrête. Oui. J'enclenche l'enregistrement. Donc. Euh... Ah oui, c'est bien fichu au fait, vous restez attribué au groupe, mais vous êtes en, en gris clair, donc euh, j'avais peur que tout le monde, euh, que ce soit tout effacé. Ok, donc sauf erreur, vous êtes tous de retour. Génial. C'est la première fois que j'utilise cette technologie des sous-groupes, et puis... Ça a l'air de bien marcher. Euh, J'ai reçu aussi un message de Steven Billet qui a vous envoyé quelques références. Je les ai ajoutées dans la conversation. Est-ce que vous les voyez Donc C'est une référence au texte de James Lurch qu'il a mentionné sur la distinction entre mastery et appropriation. 
crois qu'on l'avait pas. Un autre texte sur la formation professionnelle initiale. Vous les voyez dans le chat Non, parce que. Non, 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 tout cas, ça commence de nouveau. Le, le chat, il est vide chez vous Oui. Ouais. Non, il y a juste la référence que vous aviez donnée avant okay. sur le. D'accord. L'organisation de la formation professionnelle. Je vais recoller ces deux. Voilà. Merci. Là, c'est apparu Oui. Okay. Ouais, donc ça c'est bizarre que les, euh, que les chats restent comme ça amnésiques mais bon, pas grave ok, on a on a une trentaine de minutes pour faire un peu la synthèse de, ce, de cette activité donc, ce que je vous propose euh, c'est passer un peu en revue les, les cinq groupes, ça fait à peu près cinq minutes euh, de feedback par groupe y incluant peut-être aussi certaines réactions de votre part, donc on va être assez euh, Synthétique, ça va être un peu le speed dating de la synthèse. Euh, groupe numéro un, c'était le groupe avec euh, Alex, Anda, Béatrice, Caroline. Euh, la personne qui s'appelle Béatrice dans le dans bon. Zoom, c'est Béatrice Chevrier. Ok, mais parce que j'ai aussi un Chevrier. Ah oui, mais c'est l'autre. C'est Axel. Ah, ouais, ouais, Axel. <rire> Et c'est Axel, c'est pas Alex. Oui, ouais, ouais, tout à fait. Puis en plus, ah non, c'est Alex, il y a Alex. Mais on a réussi à les mettre dans Axel le aussi. Ah ouais, c'est vrai que ça complique, là. Ah, au fait, ça simplifie, au fait. Ah bon, d'accord. <rire> OK. Donc, euh, Axel, Béatrice, Caroline et Véronica, je vous laisse euh, faire votre synthèse. Oui, alors c'est moi qui fais la synthèse. Mm -hmm. donc, on a regardé trois situations. Donc, euh, la mienne, qui est une situation quand j'ai enfin, commencé à travailler au soins intensif pédiatrique. Celle de Axel qui travaille comme remplaçante dans le, le secondaire et celle de Véronica qui travaille dans un cabinet de physiothérapie et qui a des tâches administratives et notamment qui est chargée d'aider la physiothérapeute à rédiger des rapports pour l'AI. Et en fait, ce qu'on a remarqué, euh, alors dans mon milieu, c'est l'apprentissage, enfin, la formation, elle est très formalisée parce qu'il y a une formation de soins intensifs pour les infirmières novices. Donc, c'est un milieu qui est très euh, organisé pour l'apprentissage la, en situation de travail. Pour euh, Axel, les remplacements, il n'y a absolument rien de, de formalisé. En fait, elle arrive et puis elle doit se débrouiller seule. Et puis, euh, Véronica, elle, dans son travail... Euh, qui est, ça va au-delà des tâches administratives parce qu'elle est euh, finalement, elle doit s'occuper de décrypter la pensée de la physiothérapeute pour rédiger des, des rapports qui puissent être validés par l'AI pour que les familles obtiennent les, les subventions. Et en fait, ce qu'on a remarqué, c'est que ben, malgré ces contextes très différents, on retrouve euh, tout ce qui a été développé euh, ce matin dans, par euh, Stephen Villette. Donc, au niveau de l'engagement, ben, les trois, euh, il y a un engagement qui doit être fort de, de notre part dans, dans ces activités pour des raisons différentes. Donc, euh, mais cet engagement, il est quand même pour les trois euh, beaucoup orienté sur le, la nécessité de s'adapter au contexte et de, de s'adapter aux différentes activités dans, dans lesquelles on travaille, qui changent régulièrement et qui sont très différentes d'un moment à un autre. Euh, L'accompagnement indirect, par contre, lui, il est, euh, alors il est là en fait pour les, les trois. Mais ce qu'on a trouvé intéressant, c'est que pour euh, Véronica et moi, par exemple, si on prend l'observation, c'est quelque chose qui est autorisé. On observe et puis de l'observation, on va pouvoir imiter puis euh, apprendre. Par contre, pour Axel, elle parlait d'observation qui est volée. Parce qu'en fait, comme il n'y a personne pour accompagner, pour encadrer, elle doit finalement profiter de tous les petits moments. Elle donnait un exemple où on est à la, enfin, elle est à la photocopieuse. Elle va observer un peu en catimini ce que ses collègues font, puis écouter pour pouvoir euh, finalement s'adapter euh, dans l'établissement scolaire dans lequel elle est. Euh, et par, par contre, et Béa, je suis désolée, je dois corriger collègue. Parce que collègue, c'est... Ce n'est pas exact, parce que collègues, ce serait, on serait au même, sur le même plan. Et ce n'est pas le cas. Mmh. Voilà. OK. Pardon. Après, pour, pour la pratique en situation, euh, on a vu aussi qu'on avait finalement une manière différente, mais toutes nos, nos trois situations sont propices à l'apprentissage. Et puis, euh, pour ce qui est de l'accompagnement euh, rapproché, alors, dans le milieu dans lequel moi je suis, il y a vraiment un, un accompagnement qui est formalisé et pour lequel il y a des journées qui sont prévues où on travaille avec des tuteurs ou des formateurs pour pouvoir bénéficier de l'apprentissage. Et puis ensuite, dans les limites, 
euh, bah pour Axel et moi, ce qui était intéressant, euh, Véronica, elle, elle disait qu'il y a finalement dans les limites, elles s'y retrouvent peu parce qu'elles sont seulement deux personnes à travailler avec une très bonne connaissance de l'une de l'autre. Donc, il n'y a pas vraiment de limite à l'apprentissage. Par contre, pour Axel et moi, ce qui était intéressant, c'est que ces deux situations qui sont très contrastées en termes d'accompagnement, par contre, on retrouve les mêmes limites à des degrés différents, mais on retrouve les mêmes limites dans toutes les situations, dans les deux situations, en fait. Voilà. Je trouve intéressant cette discussion que vous avez eue sur la, la légitimité ou pas de l'observation, enfin de l'accompagnement indirect. C'est vrai qu'il y, mmh. y a des milieux dans lesquels c'est euh, autorisé, reconnu ou euh, soutenu, et il y a des milieux dans lesquels c'est plus difficile, c'est moins, euh, moins toléré. Et c'est vrai qu'en particulier dans les, les professions enseignantes, ce n'est pas évident d'ouvrir ses classes et puis de, de se faire observer par d'autres. Donc ce n'est pas vraiment dans la culture du métier. Alors qu'en effet, ça l'est peut-être beaucoup plus dans d'autres métiers où la position d'observer les autres, elle est, elle est plus reconnue comme légitime et voire nécessaire à l'apprentissage. Mm. Donc ça, je trouve que c'était en effet une observation intéressante que selon les milieux, la, la possibilité de produire de, 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 de l'accompagnement indirect est plus ou moins facile ou plus ou moins reconnue comme un, un ingrédient. Est-ce que vous avez les, les uns et les autres des, des remarques en écho à cette synthèse Moi, ça m'interpelle la question de la légitimité ou pas de l'apprentissage en regardant ou bien de la transmission. Parce que ben, je, je, bon, je, dans mon cas précis, je l'avais aussi évoqué qu'il y avait certains collègues qui n'acceptaient pas de transmettre ou qui ne voulaient pas transmettre. Et je me posais la question pourquoi Donc euh, voilà, ça peut, ça peut y faire écho. Quoi. Mm -hmm. Après, c'est ce que disait aussi Bilette ce matin, c'est qu'il y a des... Il peut y avoir des contextes professionnels dans lesquels euh, on va faire exprès de ne pas transmettre, on va, on va garder en quelque sorte le secret de son savoir pour éviter de le, le partager. Parce que le partager, ça peut être aussi euh, une menace pour, euh, pour le, le travailleur. C'est des choses qu'on observe beaucoup, par exemple dans la, la haute cuisine, les, les chefs souvent gardent les, les recettes secrètes parce que les, les transmettre, c'est aussi euh, créer la concurrence. Et donc, il y a, il y a aussi euh, l'idée de préserver euh, son, son, sa spécificité sur le, la place de travail. Donc, il peut y avoir des bonnes raisons de ne pas autoriser l'observation, de ne pas autoriser la transmission, mais ça dépend beaucoup aussi, je pense, des, des cultures de métier et des contextes professionnels. Euh, oui, euh, personnellement, enfin, j'ai une, une petite… Euh, enfin, ça pourrait euh, jouer là-dedans, c'est que euh, je pense que… Dans, dans, dans le système euh, scolaire, pas, il y a des raisons de temps, parce que les gens n'ont pas le temps. Et puis, il y a aussi des raisons de statut qui, font, qui entrent en ligne de compte. Un remplaçant, c'est quelque chose qui ne qui va pas rester forcément. C'est quelque chose qui est, qui, qui est anonyme la plupart du temps. Mmh. Et puis, euh, donc, on n'a pas besoin de lui dire bonjour, même quand il rentre dans un espace euh, euh, commun, parce qu'il existe... Euh, Là, il est juste là pour remplacer des heures et on lui donne même des cours qui ne sont même pas vraiment des cours des fois. Mmh. Et puis, euh, et par contre, ça dépend aussi de la culture des établissements. Il y a des, des établissements qui sont très bienveillants et d'autres qui le sont beaucoup moins. Mmh. Qui se, voilà, je pense que ça aussi, ça joue aussi beaucoup. Oui, puis en effet, il y a la question, voilà. est-ce qu'on reconnaît un remplaçant comme un apprenant C'est-à-dire, il n'est pas forcément euh, ni engagé, ni non, reconnu comme pas. un apprenant. Il est reconnu. Il est engagé comme quelqu'un qui vient euh, remplacer. Ce n'est voilà. pas pour autant ouais. qu'on reconnaît comme, euh, comme légitime euh, les processus d'apprentissage dans lesquels il est nécessairement engagé. Non. Ok, merci beaucoup pour ça. On va avoir un œil sur le temps. Donc, on va passer au groupe numéro 2. Donc, c'était Chris, Christelle, Constance, Jessica, Laura et Antoine. Est-ce que vous aviez un, un porte-parole Oui, c'est moi. Laura alors, du coup, des six situations qui ont été décrites, euh, ce qui ressort le plus, c'est donc la question de l'engagement, des limites et de l'accompagnement. Euh, mmh. Par rapport à l'engagement, globalement, c'est quelque chose de très important. Euh, par exemple, dans, la, dans une situation de simulation médicale, c'est euh, l'engagement dans le travail de la personne qui a permis de trouver euh, 
enfin, c'est l'engagement du formateur dans, dans la situation de, de simulation qui lui a permis de trouver euh, une solution pour un participant qui se trouvait être en, en état de choc, ce qui avait surpris le, les personnes qui étaient en présence. Donc, c'est un élément décisif dans, dans la résolution du, de la situation. Euh, dans une autre situation, l'engagement, c'est très important parce que euh, la personne doit être très autonome, indépendante. Il n'y a pas forcément d'accompagnement rapproché. Euh, même si l'accompagnement est là, euh, il faut le demander. Donc, euh, le fait d'être engagé, ça aide à, à faire le travail qu'il faut faire. Euh, il y a l'engagement aussi qui est dans une autre situation qui est stimulée par euh, des questions aux étudiants en leur demandant, par exemple, Qu'est-ce que nous avons appris aujourd'hui Donc, ça inclut le groupe, y compris l'enseignant qui, qui pose la question. Donc, une stimulation de l'engagement, euh, ça pas une question. Euh, et puis, une autre situation aussi où, euh, en gros, s'il n'y a pas d'engagement dans l'instant présent, le travail ne peut pas être fait parce qu'on est vraiment dans quelque chose d'assez euh, instantané et qui se fait vraiment dans, dans le, le moment présent. Euh, les limites qu'on a identifiées, elles sont de diverses natures. Euh, par exemple, est-ce qu'on euh, peut se demander, par exemple, dans des, la situation de simulation médicale, est-ce que les apprentissages sont euh, inappropriés pour le participant, sachant que la situation a créé un état de choc chez le participant euh, On peut se demander si voilà, les apprentissages qui étaient prévus n'étaient pas euh, inappropriés. Euh, ensuite, une autre limite d'une autre situation c'est, euh, par exemple, euh, de se demander, dans une situation de stage où, justement, il n'y a, a pas vraiment de, un peu d'accompagnement, beaucoup de flou aussi au niveau de l'institution, euh, quels sont les apprentissages qui vont ressortir de ce stage et euh, ou quels sont les buts euh, dans l'institution maintenant, sachant qu'il y a eu un changement dans les services et puis un, un manque d'informations, un, un flou, on va dire. Euh, une, dans une autre situation, une limite qui était de se dire, enfin de se demander euh, quand l'enseignant demandait qu'est-ce que nous avons appris aujourd'hui, et par exemple, que se passe-t-il si un étudiant ne répond pas ou dit qu'il n'a entre guillemets rien appris, comment est-ce qu'on peut réagir à ça Et euh, l'absence la, la, d'accompagnement dans certaines situations était pointée du coup comme euh, une limite. Et pour terminer, au niveau de l'accompagnement, et on a, de manière générale, il y a d'importantes variations entre les, les accompagnements qui sont relativement soutenus et en, enfin, où les, les, les personnes dans le travail sont très encadrées, euh, voire, et des situations où il y a une absence euh, d'accompagnement, euh, sachant qu'il y, bah, y avait un peu deux niveaux d'accompagnement. Il y avait l'accompagnement, euh, par exemple, d'un étudiant par l'enseignant, enfin, la personne qui décrit la situation, est-ce qu'elle est accompagnée par l'encadrant ou dans la simulation médicale, est-ce que la personne accompagne d'autres personnes Donc, euh, voilà, c'était un peu ça, le... les points essentiels. Les situations dont vous avez discuté, dont vous avez parlé de la simulation médicale, il y avait quoi comme Oui, vous... pardon, je n'ai pas, pas tout décrit. Alors, donc, il y en a une, c'était la situation, simulation pardon, médicale. La, simulation médicale. la deuxième, c'était un stage pour des publics migrants en difficulté d'apprentissage du français. Oui. Donc, ça, c'est là où je parlais des flous dans l'institution, le, le manque de repères. Mmh. Ensuite, euh, là où l'enseignante posait la question des apprentissages, c'était euh, des, des étudiants en, enfin, euh, en auxiliaire de vie dans un atelier de cuisine. Mmh. Ensuite, il y avait une situation de, de euh, une personne qui était jeune diplômée, qui était responsable de vie scolaire dans un internat de jeunes filles. Okay. Et puis, encore deux autres situations. Il y avait une situation, la personne est formatrice en français langue d'intégration pour migrants, donc des cours d'appui pour des de, de français. Et puis, la dernière, c'est de la vente, enfin, dans un magasin de, de vente alimentaire. OK. Voilà. Super, merci beaucoup. Euh, groupe numéro 3. Alors, c'était le groupe avec Fadi, Isabelle, Lorenz, euh, Lucia et Maude. Oui, alors, nous, on a eu, on était cinq. 
euh, on a eu cinq situations très différentes. Euh, une situation, en fait, on a eu le, un gros débat quand on a commencé à essayer de répondre chacun aux questions euh, sur le sujet situation de travail. Et quand euh, j'écoute finalement les présentations des autres, je sens la même, euh, le même petit décalage, on va dire, de définition. Parce qu'on s'est posé la question de savoir si situation de travail, c'était travail dans son ensemble ou une situation précise d'apprentissage en situation de travail. Donc, euh, on a eu ce débat-là et finalement, ça ressort aussi dans ce qui est présenté. C'est que soit on parle de situation très globale, soit on parle de situation très précise. Donc, nous, on a essayé, euh, après discussion, de se focaliser sur un aspect de la situation euh, Notamment après le passage de M. Filieta qui nous a dit de nous focaliser dessus pour éviter qu'on ait trop, mmh. euh, trop à dire. Et même comme ça, on a été un peu limite au niveau du temps. Euh, donc, on a une situation. La première, c'est euh, la digitalisation de formation. Euh, début, début, je ne sais plus la date, début mai dernier, début mars dernier, je crois. Je ne sais plus exactement. <rire> C'était début mars oui, oui, mais pas de souci, peu importe. C'est pour, pour la crise du Covid. <rire> voilà. Euh, donc, il y a une digitalisation de formation. Euh, ensuite, on a eu euh, une, euh, une, un poste d'aide de bureau en comptabilité. On a eu le poste de euh, veilleur dans un centre de toxicodépendants. On a eu les, le poste de répétition et de répétiteurs et puis euh, la situation de moniteur socioculturel en maison de quartier et en fait de ce qui ressort de manière générale c'est que tous on, a un, on avait tous un engagement dans le travail qui partait euh, soit d'une obligation soit d'une volonté qui était propre et il y avait un engagement du travail euh, intense euh, par contre ce qui a été rigolo de voir c'était que on a eu des accompagnements très différents euh, il y en a qui étaient très accompagnés et qui du coup étaient plus sûrs ils avaient vraiment une progression en fait dans ce qu'ils dans ce qu'ils faisaient alors que d'autres bah, c'est un peu en tâtonnement et puis on allait chercher une information à gauche à droite parce que finalement on est plus seul et en autonomie ce qui implique du coup aussi que bah, on a des apprentissages parfois qui nous semblent inappropriés et je mets il nous semble parce que quand on n'est pas accompagné ben bah, comme on fait à sa sauce, c'est parfois difficile de dire si c'est vraiment inapproprié ou pas. Et grosso modo, voilà. Est-ce que quelqu'un veut ajouter quelque chose Non, c'était bien résumé. Merci. Oui. Très bien, merci Maud. Ce que vous disiez par rapport aux, aux apprentissages inappropriés, c'était le fait que quand on n'est pas accompagné, on ne peut pas savoir si ce qu'on apprend, c'est juste ou pas bah, disons qu'on comme on passe souvent par tâtonnement, euh, on finit par réussir de toute façon à atteindre le but, mais on passe par des, des moments où on est un peu dans le flou en fait. Mm -hmm. Et que peut-être que notre manière d'aborder la situation en question n'est pas la bonne, mais comme on n'en a pas d'autres parce qu'on tâtonne, ben, ça emmène une procédure un petit peu erronée. Je mets mm -hmm. des guillemets parce que finalement on s'en sort quand même, mais c'était plutôt de ce point de vue-là. D'accord. C'est vrai qu'après, je trouve intéressant parce que bon, c'est vrai que Billette parle de ça en disant qu'on n'apprend pas que des choses justes ou des choses légitimes ou véridiques dans, dans, dans le travail. Mais ce que je pense aussi, c'est que enfin, selon les métiers, ce n'est pas évident de savoir qu'est-ce qu'un apprentissage approprié ou inapproprié parce que le rapport à ce qui est juste ou faux, est ce qui est correct ou incorrect ou légitime ou illégitime n'est pas toujours de même nature. Donc, euh, enfin, je pense que enfin, dans les différents contextes que vous avez euh, évoqués dans ce groupe, mais aussi dans d'autres, selon qu'on est euh, euh, auxiliaire de vie ou euh, qu'on est aux soins intensifs, hein, peut-être la, la différence entre euh, un geste professionnel correct ou incorrect, euh, légitime ou illégitime, elle peut, faire, elle peut faire débat dans un cas ou au contraire, elle ne fait pas du tout débat dans un autre. Parce que voilà, quand on est aux soins intensifs, il y a peut-être des choses qui sont, il y a des savoirs qui sont peut-être beaucoup plus établis ou sur un registre du juste ou faux, de, de l'évidence, 
et, et puis au contraire, il y a peut-être aussi d'autres types de, de, de gestes, même dans ce même milieu, qui peuvent porter à un débat où tout le monde ne serait pas d'accord sur savoir est-ce que c'est légitime de les apprendre ou pas. Donc, je trouve intéressant que, enfin, on peut voir que la question des apprentissages appropriés, elle, est, elle peut être posée par la présence ou pas d'un accompagnement pour qu'il nous aide peut-être à lire la situation et est-ce que euh, quelque chose est, est, est légitime ou pas dans, dans ce qu'on apprend. Mais peut-être aussi il y a une variation selon les, les contextes professionnels ou la question de... Euh, qu'une connaissance vraie ou fausse ne se pose pas de manière identique. Oui, Florence Patricia, excuse-moi. Patricia, pas de problème. J'aurais juste une question, parce que si j'ai bien compris ce que Maud, tu as dit, tu as dit qu'au niveau de l'engagement, il y avait des gens qui étaient, euh, pas forcés, mais un peu que c'était obligatoire, alors que d'autres s'étaient engagés volontairement. Est-ce que vous avez vu des différences, du coup, euh, ou des limites liées au type d'engagement De ce qui est ressorti, je n'ai pas spécialement l'impression. Ce qui influence énormément, c'est la présence de, on va dire, de monitorat, si on veut bien, ou de guidance. Euh, ça, ça influence beaucoup. Par contre, le fait qu'on soit engagé volontairement ou pas, ça influence finalement assez peu les apprentissages, a priori même si ce n'est pas ce qui est dit dans l'article de Villette. <rire> Mais euh, après, c'est peut-être simplement une question de motivation. De... Genre, je, je fais mon travail, c'est une partie de mon travail que je n'ai pas le choix, je dois le faire. Et du coup, comme il y a une motivation intrinsèque qui vient pas forcément de la tâche elle-même, mais du travail de manière générale, on s'engage dedans parce que ça fait partie de notre travail. Ok, merci beaucoup pour euh, cette restitution. On va passer au groupe numéro 4 avec euh, Léa, Mathéo, Melvin, Natacha, Pascaline et euh, Sarah. Oui, alors euh, nous on a eu des, des expériences et des statuts dans, dans les situations d'apprentissage qu'on a évoquées assez différentes. Euh, trois qui étaient des, des stagiaires, mais dans des stages qui, qui sont assez différents les uns des autres. Euh, une qui était là comme, euh, comme aide aux, aux parents, un dans l'enseignement et euh, une euh, dans, le, dans une association, si je m'en fais bien. Et euh, que on, on, on pensait qu'il y a des caractéristiques individuelles euh, et personnelles des apprenants qui vont influencer sur euh, l'apprentissage sur le workplace comme des attitudes face euh, à cet apprentissage, des systèmes de de, de valeurs également. Euh, il y a aussi des, des environnements de travail avec des degrés de prescription plus ou moins élevés. Euh, des endroits, par exemple, où la sécurité et l'hygiène sont très élevés, il y a moins de possibilités d'observation ou euh, de pratique directement euh, du travail qui font qu'il qu qu est plus difficile d'apprendre par euh, ces systèmes-là ou bien d'autres comme euh, l'enseignement, les stages dans l'enseignement où euh, on est, on est amené beaucoup à, à observer et puis à, ensuite à mettre en pratique euh, ce qu'on a pu observer. Euh, euh, on a parlé également des différences d'autorité de et de euh, légitimité. Ça revient un peu à ce qui avait été dit euh, un peu auparavant. Dans la légitimité, on parlait de ne pas transmettre le savoir. Alors ici, nous, ce qui est venu, c'est que parfois aussi, il y a euh, cette transmission qu'on qu essaie de faire de manière forcée où, euh, en fonction de la légitimité, les personnes qui ont euh, une expérience, qui travaillent depuis longtemps et qui ont donc, euh, un certain statut, qui vont vouloir aussi imposer leur façon de faire et qu'à euh, ce moment-là, pardon, et qu'à ce moment-là, euh, ben, parfois on est forcé d'adapter notre manière de, de travailler ou alors, ben, en fonction justement de euh, nos, nos systèmes de valeurs, eh ben, on peut euh, euh, rentrer dans une discussion par rapport à, à, à cette, euh, ce travail qu'on essaie d'imposer. Euh, donc, euh, souvent, ce qui, a, ce qui apparaissait, c'était qu'il ben, y avait des collègues, en tout cas dans les, chez les enseignants, qui, est, qui nous donnaient des conseils pour, euh, pour euh, travailler qui étaient basés sur leur façon de faire parce qu'eux, ils avaient ce statut d'ancienneté et puis euh, 
et puis euh, de professionnel. Euh, on a parlé aussi des relations, que ce soit avec les, les collègues qui, qui nous aident dans l'apprentissage ou avec les tuteurs, qui, euh, si elles sont bonnes ou si elles sont mauvaises, peuvent influencer notamment la motivation de l'apprenant euh, sur euh, le lieu de travail. Et puis, euh, que la motivation avait un impact réel sur euh, l'investissement de, de l'apprenant. Puis, il y a, il y a donc des environnements comme celui-ci où on a beaucoup d'aide des collègues ou bien des tuteurs, mais il y a aussi certaines situations de stage où, par exemple, on peut se retrouver seul, sans aide des tuteurs et que là, il est plus difficile d'observer et donc d'imiter. Et puis, même s'il s'agit juste de discussion, d'apprendre sur le lieu de travail. Voilà, on a parlé du fait de comprendre, d'accepter le but de ce qu'on fait pour pouvoir mieux rentrer dans le travail. Que le... le les guidages étaient un peu différents pour, pour chacun. Et puis, Léa, à la fin, a soulevé la question euh, du workplace learning en télétravail et comment, euh, comment se, se positionner face au workplace alors que euh, le lieu de travail, et maintenant, c'est aussi le lieu de vie. Donc, euh, voilà, une question à, à discuter. En effet, c'est vrai que la, la question de la... La limite de la place de travail dans ce contexte-là, elle, elle se pose. Merci beaucoup pour cette synthèse. Est-ce que vous avez des réactions, des, des demandes de précision Ok, super. Donc, on donne la parole pour terminer au groupe numéro 5. Donc, Patricia, Pauline, Quentin, Sano et Sidney. Ok, alors du coup, euh, nous au niveau des situations, la première c'était euh, dans un pôle senior et handicap dans une formation. Euh, le deuxième c'était de la médiation sociale et urbaine qui est un nouveau métier qui a une dizaine d'années. Euh, la troisième euh, situation c'était dans une entreprise pharmaceutique internationale. Ensuite on avait une tenue de caisse euh, dans une boulangerie et puis euh, un stage en enseignement primaire. Euh, donc nous au niveau du... Comme on a construit, on a chacun présenté nos, nos différentes situations et on a décidé de faire un retour global. Donc, au niveau des potentialités, chez chacun, euh, il y avait la présence d'un mentor ou d'une personne de référence. Euh, on a tous été d'accord sur le fait que c'était des situations très concrètes et puis proches de la, réali euh, de la réalité du métier, pardon. Euh, et que tous, on était passé par une phase d'observation, soit des collègues, soit des mentors, soit des personnes présentes dans l'entreprise ou euh, dans l'institution dans laquelle on était. Au niveau des limites, euh, il y avait potentiellement de la résistance de la part des experts, soit euh, au niveau de former, soit au niveau euh, d'accompagner ou de se mettre à, à jour. Euh, il y avait souvent un manque de temps, typiquement dans euh, la question de la tenue de la caisse. Euh, c'était compliqué parce que souvent, c'est un apprentissage qui se fait en gestion de stress. Et puis du coup, on va plutôt tenter de résoudre le problème vu qu'on est en situation réelle et très euh, ben, directe. Et puis parfois, on a relevé quasi chez tout le monde une forme de manque de motivation des experts à transmettre ou à partager ou à proposer un retour adapté. Euh, puis au niveau des apprentissages effectués, euh, on a tous remarqué que c'était de l'apprentissage euh, en faisant, donc en pratiquant le learning by doing. Euh, c'était plutôt un apprentissage de gestes métier ou d'un métier dans sa globalité, donc soit de gestes très précis faisant partie du quotidien, soit d'une posture ou d'une forme de professionnalisme. Euh, que les apprentissages ils étaient plus efficients chez tout le monde quand c'était une situation nouvelle qui était rencontrée et que euh, très souvent, on avait euh, ben justement des choses nouvelles et pas forcément des, des apprentissages de type routinier. Après, avec chaque, euh, chaque situation qui avait des, des spécificités, mais euh, voilà, je crois que j'ai fait le tour. Ok, merci beaucoup pour, euh, pour cette synthèse. Est-ce que, euh, en ayant fait l'exercice de cette activité 1, vous avez peut-être vu émerger des, euh, des questions, que ce soit des questions conceptuelles ou des questions en lien avec les, les, les repères théoriques que, que, que Bilette vous a montrés, où on pourrait voir qu'ils ont 
peut-être certaines limites ou au contraire qui fonctionnent bien enfin, des, je pensais à des choses qu'on pourrait peut-être lui restituer demain pour peut-être l'interpeller sur un ou l'autre aspect peut-être qu'en faisant l'exercice vous avez soit repéré des phénomènes qui n'étaient pas vraiment traités dans, dans le cadre qu'il a présenté ou au contraire des éléments qu'il a présentés qui ne semblaient pas convenir aux situations que vous avez euh, observées est-ce qu'il y aurait des choses comme ça qu'on pourrait lui faire remonter et discuter avec lui demain matin je ne sais pas si c'est pour le faire remonter, mais moi, je me suis rendu compte que je n'étais pas sûre d'avoir bien compris la question de l'engagement, parce qu'on a parlé d'engagement de, fort dans le travail, etc. Et puis, quand on regardait la slide, il me semblait qu'il y avait des choses qui étaient en lien avec la procédure et la routine. J'aimerais bien que vous puissiez peut-être préciser cette notion. Pas évident de préciser la notion de, de quelqu'un d'autre et puis en plus de présent, pré préciser une notion comme celle d'engagement qui, a, enfin, au-delà de son travail à lui, a donné lieu à beaucoup, beaucoup de, de, de travaux. Mais en tout cas, il me semble que ce que, euh, ce que lui met derrière, c'est en quelque sorte la, la, la part du processus d'apprentissage qui est dans la sphère de responsabilité de, de l'individu. C'est un peu comme ça qu'on pourrait le, le voir. Euh, et et c'est tout ce que peut... Euh, faire l'individu par rapport à ses propriétés personnelles pour contribuer à ce processus qu'est qu l'apprentissage. Donc c'est vraiment une, la, la vision du, du processus d'apprentissage perçu du point de vue de l'apprenant et de, de sa capacité d'action pour, pour influencer positivement ou négativement ce processus d'apprentissage. Donc, en effet, après, ça peut être l'engagement dans l'action, ça peut être l'engagement par rapport à des savoirs, ça peut être l'engagement par rapport à des, euh, à des opportunités qui lui sont euh, offertes. Euh, mais disons que c'est regarder, en quelque sorte, le processus d'apprentissage du point de vue du sujet et de sa, de sa contribution à, à cela. Donc, par exemple, les routines... Euh, Enfin, on, on pourrait considérer que ça, ça peut être lu comme un ingrédient de, de l'engagement parce que ça, enfin, le fait de pouvoir répéter des gestes ou le pouvoir de développer des, des automatismes par rapport à ça, c'est une manière de, de penser à l'apprentissage du point de vue de, du, du pouvoir du sujet dans, dans, ce, dans ces mécanismes-là. Voilà, c'est un peu la, la, le, le, le type de de réponse que je pourrais faire. Enfin, Peut-être qu'on pourra lui demander demain de, de préciser un petit peu euh, sa définition de, de l'engagement et puis euh, les rapports qu'il voit entre routine et engagement. Il y avait autre chose, autrement, que vous aviez relevé, euh, que ce soit des questions de compréhension, des questions d'adaptation, de, d'application ou de transfert de, de ces outils à vos situations moi, je trouvais intéressant la, la question qui a été soulevée euh, par rapport au, au télétravail. Mm -hmm. Parce qu'on entend beaucoup parler là, de, des questions de télétravail, mais alors d'une part par rapport à l'engagement et puis au, au soutien peut-être dans l'apprentissage, mais peut-être aussi euh, on en entend beaucoup parler dans le cadre de la manière dont les supérieurs hiérarchiques peuvent euh, accompagner... Euh, leurs collaborateurs dans le cadre du télétravail. Et là, je trouve que ce serait intéressant d'entendre son avis à ce sujet. Mm -hmm. C'est vrai qu'on pourrait, le, on pourrait le, le brancher un petit peu sur cette, cette question-là, sur à la fois les, les transformations que ça induit dans le, le travail. Ça, il en a parlé un peu euh, déjà ce matin, mais surtout, la, enfin, je pense que c'était un peu la, la manière dont, dont Léa l'avait amené euh, sur la, la limite entre le, le travail et euh, la sphère privée, quand on dit l'apprentissage au travail. Là. Euh, le haut travail peut être aussi euh, ancré dans d'autres espaces et du coup ça pose aussi la question des, euh, des, euh, des frontières entre l'apprentissage la, au travail et d'autres types d'apprentissage donc en effet on pourrait, on pourrait euh, aborder cette thématique avec lui demain matin ok alors ce que je vous propose c'est qu'on va faire une pause euh, donc on va se retrouver à 15h30 donc, ce que je vous demanderais, c'est peut-être de rester connecté parce que si vous quittez la session, j'ai peur que vous disparaissiez des groupes. Donc, mettez simplement votre micro et votre caméra en pause. On se retrouve à 15h30 pour aborder le chapitre sur la dimension du curriculum. OK
Moi, je voulais m'excuser. Je suis désolée, j'ai eu une coupure de Wi-Fi, donc une, la limite de mon apprentissage au moment où vous répondiez. Je suis désolée. <rire> D'accord, mais tout ça, c'est enregistré. Donc, si jamais vous avez re retrouvé ça. Et donc, j'ai... Donc, euh, bienvenue à, à tous pour cette euh, dernière session de, du vendredi. Euh, J'espère que vous avez euh, encore un peu d'énergie. Donc, euh, ce qu'on va faire euh, cet après-midi, c'est bon, on, va, on va avancer dans le, dans le programme. Vous allez voir à partir de maintenant, on va, on va s'intéresser plus aux dimensions, on va dire, euh, pédagogiques de l'apprentissage au travail. C'est-à-dire que la question qu'on va se poser, c'est une fois qu'on a diagnostiqué un peu les forces et les faiblesses de l'apprentissage en situation de travail, la question c'est comment est-ce qu'on peut essayer d'outiller euh, les formateurs ou les, les milieux professionnels pour essayer de, de soutenir les processus d'apprentissage en lien avec la pratique. Et vous allez voir que dans ce domaine, euh, Stephen Billet fait, fait une distinction un peu entre trois grandes, euh, trois grandes avenues possibles pour essayer de soutenir les apprentissages au travail. Il y a ce qu'il appelle les, les, les pratiques curriculaires, qui sont des manières d'organiser l'expérience euh, dans le travail pour qu'elle soit apprenante. Il y a ce qu'il appelle les pratiques pédagogiques, qui sont les activités et les interactions qui peuvent soutenir les apprentissages au travail. Et il y a ce qu'il appelle les pratiques épistémiques personnelles, qui sont les, euh, la manière dont les, le, le pouvoir d'action des individus peut euh, soutenir ou pas des processus d'apprentissage. Donc, on va voir cet après-midi le premier des trois axes, la pratique curriculaire. Et puis, les deux autres, la pratique pédagogique et les pratiques épistémiques, il les présentera demain matin en direct. Donc, pour vous ayez un peu une image globale. Et puis, on terminera demain après-midi avec la question de l'intégration entre le travail et la formation. Alors, comme vous le savez, pour cet après-midi, bon, Stephen Billet est en train de dormir maintenant, j'espère pour lui. Donc, il a préparé une, une petite une vignette vidéo donc sur le contenu du chapitre sur le curriculum de la pratique. Donc, ce que je vous propose, c'est qu'on va regarder cette vidéo ensemble, normalement en partageant mon écran et en, en activant le son de l'ordinateur, ça devrait être de bonne qualité. Donc, on va regarder, ça dure 34 minutes. Donc, on va faire un peu comme s'il présentait devant nous. Sachez que vous pourrez bien sûr revisionner cette capsule vidéo, elle est à disposition sur, euh, sur YouTube et puis vous y accédez par le lien Moodle. Okay Donc on va regarder ensemble cette, euh, cette vignette et puis euh, ensuite je vous lancerai dans la dernière activité de la journée qui sera toujours en lien avec vos situations de référence où vous serez amené aussi à transposer et appliquer les, les concepts présentés dans cette capsule. Okay des questions ou des remarques c'est tout bon Alors, je vais partager mon écran. Euh, voilà. Est-ce que vous voyez, vous voyez la totalité de, de l'écran, là Oui. OK. Alors, je vais lancer la, la vidéo. Il faudra juste me dire si vous entendez bien le son. Good afternoon. I hope the presentation and the discussion was... Vous entendez le son là Oui, mais c'est pas incroyable. C'est pas incroyable. C'est pas, pas assez fort, je pense. Ok, alors ce que je vais faire, c'est que je vais juste essayer de voir si je peux faire passer le, le son, euh, partage de son de l'ordinateur. Voilà, il faut partager le son de l'ordinateur pour que ça fonctionne, c'est ça Voilà. Euh... <coughs> Attendez, tac. Alors là, c'est bizarre, ça me fait quelque chose de tout sombre. Okay. Okay. 
good afternoon. I hope the presentation and the discussions this morning were helpful for you. In this session, which is recorded, is que c'est mieux là? Oui. Ok. Alors je vous laisse. Pardon. Je laisse le, la vidéo. The focus is on enhancing the learning potential of workplaces. And how I'd like to proceed is in this session, refer to um, a focus on the workplace as a learning environment, and in particular, focusing on the concept of the practice curriculum or the learning curriculum. And that is the organization and enactment of experiences in the workplace and how these can develop the kind of capacities which um, people need for their work. That's what we'll do this in this session. And then tomorrow we will focus on practice pedagogies, uh, which are the processes of augmenting and supporting learning through work. And then also a consideration of individuals personal epistemologies and that is the means by which individuals come to engage in and learn through their work. So those will be two live sessions tomorrow. And this of course is supported by the handout which you've received. Okay so this concept of practice or learning curriculum which is the sequence of experiences that um, individuals engage in in the workplace and through which they learn. Now it's, it's, it's probably important to commence with some curriculum concepts so that we can apply these to our understanding of how people learn through work. And perhaps the most important point and principal point to make is the origins of the word curriculum refers to the course to run, the track to follow, or the pathway to progress along. That is a series of experiences. So the concept that we'll be referring to here is quite central to understandings of the word curriculum. And anthropological studies that look at how people develop knowledge to continue and enact cultural practices notice that there are sets of pathways that individuals progress along. Because this is about curriculum, um, I want to emphasize three very important conceptions of curriculum that apply to what happens in educational institutions as much as what happens in workplace. The first one of these is the intended curriculum. That is what is to be achieved through educational experiences. So in schools and universities and colleges, there's often a document called a syllabus, and that's used to set out what is supposed to happen and the kind of learning outcomes that are to be achieved. And you'll notice that these are referred to as intended learning outcomes because they can never be guaranteed. Then there is the enacted curriculum, and that is what happens when experiences are provided for learners, albeit in education institutions or in the workplaces. And what is enacted is a product of a range of factors, including the kind of activities and interactions that are made available to learners. And that's the case again, regardless of whether we're talking about what occurs in, in um, educational settings or in workplaces. So this is what happens. And the third form of curriculum, and as somebody principally interested in learning, this is perhaps the most important one, and that is the experience curriculum. That is what individuals experience and learn from what is, what is provided for them, what is enacted. And that is that as individuals engage in experiences, it, they engage in the process of construing and constructing knowledge from what they experience. That is 
humans are active meaning makers and they will make sense of experiences and they'll do so in different ways. And that's why it's helpful to separate the concept of experiences that, that happen, but also the process of experiencing. That is how people come to make sense of and experience those. So in the diagram on the right hand side, you'll see a, a, a set of pathways and people will take different pathways according to their needs and according to how they want to go and where they want to go. So whereas you, the, a pathway might be set out, people will use the pathways in particular, reason, for, in, in particular ways to meet their, their purposes. So these are important conceptual foundations when there's and in curriculum, that the original meaning of the word curriculum is about a course of activities of which, along which you progress, and that these have been identified within anthropology as the means by which uh, people engage in culturally derived practices to learn them and progress along them. And so there's the intended curriculum, what's supposed to happen, the enacted curriculum, the realities of what happens when experiences are provided, and then thirdly, um, the experience curriculum, and that is um, how people come to learn from what is provided for them. So the practice or, or workplace curriculum. Across the literature, it's possible to identify that there are two broad ways of categorizing the way that people learn through practice. The first one is referred to as apprenticeship as a way of life, and that is what happens when you simply engage in and learn through the lived experience of participating within a particular community. And here we have examples from Jordan who referred to the process of midwives, uh, birth attendants in Mexico. By participating in the practice of, of, of birth attendants, coming to learn its practices. And then Bun, um, who um, researched nomadic tribes in Kyrgyzstan found that uh, young people learnt much of the knowledge they required to be effective in those communities simply by engaging in the lived experiences. And that is that they learned how to ride horses, how to herd cattle or yaks, how to capture animals, how to skin animals and how to use every part of the animal for different kind of purposes beyond what, what is eaten and that they learned these skills simply through participating in the community and there was very little evidence of teaching. So this is how largely how people have learned occupations across much of human history, for instance, that in earlier times, particularly before industrialization, you learned the skills that were being used within your family and that, you know, that Whatever the family business was, you engaged in it from a very early age and you learned those skills and you participated it in the lived experience which was played out within the household. Then secondly, there's the deliberate structuring of experiences. And, and this is when the, the provision of experiences alone and um, through everyday activity is insufficient. And Bum provides an example here. So, for instance, although much of the knowledge required to be effective in these nomadic tribes in uh, Kyrgyzstan came through the lived experience, there were certain skills that could only be required, acquired through particular kinds of deliberate structuring of experiences. One of those was learning to be a blacksmith. So to, to learn to become a blacksmith meant you had to leave your family and go and be apprenticed in the family that did blacksmithing. Similarly, to be um, a maker of the yurts, these homes that the nomadic tribes lived in, you had to go and live in and be part of a family whose role it was to actually make the yurts, those mobile homes. And then if you wanted to be a traditional storyteller, what you had to do was, to, again, you had to engage in a long-term apprenticeship with one of those storytellers to learn the, the, the epic stories and to learn how to enact them. And all of this was deliberately structured simply because you would not learn those forms of knowledge 
within your own family. Now, as we stand back and look in contemporary times, it's far more likely that we will learn through deliberate structuring of experiences rather than apprenticeship as a way of life. Yes, if you live in and grow up on a farm, for instance, you might learn many of the skills required uh, to be a farmer. But most of the skills that we learn um, have to come from other experiences, structured experiences, because uh, they're not part of our, our lived experience. So the ordering of experiences seems to be important. And what we see from studies, um, particularly from anthropology, is that there's often a sequencing of experiences. So for instance, uh, Jean Lave, in her studies of uh, understanding how tailors learn their craft, found that the principle behind the progression that the apprentice tailors engaged in was moving from um, activities where if mistakes were made, there would be little limited consequences through to activities where if an error was made, the consequences would be greater. So for instance, um, apprentice um, tailors first, look, first of all started making children's undergarments. And if they made a mistake with those garments, it wasn't a problem. Then they went on to make um, uh, adults undergarments and you know, slightly more uh, care was needed and a higher level of skills. Then they went on to make adults outer garments and shirts and the likes. And then later they finished off by making ceremonial garments where they, the garments were made of the expensive fabric. And if mistakes were made, there were high error costs. So just as you would not put a novice to manage in a very expensive piece of equipment, um, but rather somebody who knew how to use that piece of equipment, the principle played out here in terms of this sequence in experience where uh, the movement was from low error risk to, to situations where um, error risk came at a greater cost. So for instance, this is, is, this is the case in, 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 in tailoring, also in the studies that I had done of hairdressers. Firstly, apprentice hairdressers start by washing clients' hair. Actually, they don't. They start, first of all, by greeting um, clients into the hairdressing salon. And then they start asking them if, for instance, they want tea or coffee. And if so, black or white or with sugar or without sugar. And then they move on to keeping the hairdressing salon neat and tidy. Now, these, these tasks might seem to be busy work but they're actually very important. Greeting the customers develops the skills in communicating with customers and finding out their needs. And keeping the salon clean and tidy is important for developing skills about tidiness, looking after tools, and keeping a workplace which is healthy and safe. Then they go on to start working with clients. And one of the first tasks they do is wash the client's hair. And this often occurs in part of the hairdressing salon that is quiet and then the hairdresser can engage in conversation with the clients. One of the next tasks they do is actually washing the hair, but washing chemicals out of the hair after dyes have been used or, um, or, or perm solutions have been used to bring about effects in the hair. And that's a greater risk because if all of the dyes and chemicals are not taken out, you can get some interesting effects. And so it's a more, um, uh, it's a task that has risk consequences associated with it. Then the hairdressers go on to perform simple um, tasks such as putting curling rods in hair and they practice that. Um, and then they engage in other forms of, of preparing the hair. And then normally uh, what they have to do before they cut women's hair they have to practice on men. Because if they make a mistake with a man's hair, it's not a big problem. But if they make a mistake with women's hair, it's a very big problem. Similarly with production workers, in studies that I've done of production workers, what I found there is that um, there's often a sequence that occurs that the novice will move through. And in one uh, factory which produced breakfast cereal, uh, they actually start in the packaging room and then move forward to where the cereals are manufactured. 
The point is that they need to know what, what, what happens to the end product, how the end product is organized, how getting the right amount of, um, of cereal in the sachets is important to fit in the boxes. And then as they come forward, then they know the kind of goals that they need to achieve in mixing the cereal and putting them in the sachets. And then there's the, the example of room attendance. Now, this is a small hotel in Singapore called the Marina Bay, uh, Marina Bay Sands, I beg your pardon. It's a 1,300 rooms and it dominates the um, skyline around the harbour area. And this um, hotel, as I said, has 1,300 rooms, but they have great difficulty hiring room attendants in Singapore because Singaporeans don't want to do this kind of work. So they bring people over from, um, from mainland China, from Thailand, Indonesia, etc., to do this, this kind of work. However, many of those do not speak English, but they have a very base curriculum that, process that they go through. Firstly, the room attendant works in a room that is without guests. That is the guests have left. It's called a checked out room. In that room, the novice attendee, attendee learns how to organize the bathroom, make the bathroom nice and clean, put all of the utensils out and the cloths and the soaps and things out in a particular way, make the bed up in a particular way, which includes getting the pillows tightly in the pillowcases and placing them on the bed like that and then making the, the bed very nice and tight. Only when the room attendant has, has demonstrated their competence to do that task well, and to do it at a certain pace, are they moved into checked in rooms. The point there is that once they're in a checked in room, they might encounter a guest and will need to be engaging with the guests. So before they reach that point, and um, the idea is that they will have developed the skills associated with being a room attendant and know how to prepare the room um, in, a, in a very competent way. So they're not actually consciously focusing on that and then can engage with the uh, clients. So, and also with doctors, um, there's a process that Sinclair referred to as when junior doctors start in hospitals. Uh, what often happens is they're asked to do the history taking and the examination of patients that have already had that done. And then the, 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 the novice doctor then goes and reports to the senior clinician and says, this is what the, the history is and this is what came out of my examination. And they check on that. So this is a practice of moving through from a situation where um, an, if an error occurs, um, the, at the beginning, there's little, little limitations, so little cost to it, but as you progress, um, where errors can be more demanding. There's also other kind of pathways, and I'll talk about this in a minute. But one of them, for instance, is what Singleton identified in Japan in, in a place which makes um, uh, teapots, uh, Japanese ceremonial teapots. And that is the key pathway of experience was being able to access and engage with a key artifact, which is the potter's wheel upon which the, the clay is turned and turned into the pottery artifacts. So in this uh, sheet, which is in your, the first table of your handout, uh, we have a number of these um, different uh, pathways, different curriculum practices that are applicable to workplaces. The first one of these is uh, the apprenticeship as a way of life. And I've referred to that already in terms of what Bunn reported and what Jordan reported in terms of the progression and what Lave reported. Uh, Makovici, by the way, uh, her study was on uh, the production of lace and the way that that progressed through from um, easier type of lace making through to more complex um, kind of ways. And in this table, what you'll see in the right hand column is the practice. In the middle column, there's the description. And in the right hand column, what is, is the, uh, the purposes of actually this model of curriculum. And I'm hoping that these will provide interesting examples for you. And 
the, the next one down is, sorry, that's the practice one. And here is the, the uh, sequence of experiencing. And this then is uh, the, the pathway that comes through so that people can actually learn tasks and move in a progression which develops those kinds of uh, capacities. And this third one is, um, is also a, a, a program of development, a learning curriculum. And this is um, a process through which, um, a, which what I've already referred to as moving from activities that have low risk associated with them through to activities which have greater risk associated with them. And the fourth one is the one from the pottery studies. And what, what happens here is that the, the sequence of learning is very much dependent upon the novice's access to the potter's wheel. And this is used for production purposes. So the, its use is important and the apprentice's time on it is, needs to be worked around when it's not being used for production purposes. First of all, however, the apprentice has to observe what happens and observe um, in a way that allows them to see how the experienced potters hold their hands and, and form the clay. And they do that observation while they're engaged in cleaning activities in and around the potting potter wheel. And then what they do is then they actually um, are able to use the potter's wheel during lunch breaks and in the evenings when the wheel isn't being used and they can experiment on it and try and get the sense of, of feel for it. And then they move on to having structured practice to build their capacities um, more effectively and then eventually they engage in a process of, of, of a series of activities of making fairly basic pots which are then used for particular purposes and perhaps sold to cover the cost of their, um, uh, their apprenticeship. And then the, the, the fifth model here I'm just going to explain is, is what's called parallel practice. And this is when um, the novice does something in parallel with the more experienced worker. So in the case of a medical student, in this case, learning how to um, do examinations and history taking of patients. What happens is that the medical student or junior doctor works in a parallel consulting room to the experienced doctor. And the, the student or junior medical doctor will do the history taking of the patient and do the examination of the patient and then will ask the qualified doctor to come in and they'll share with them the history taking and the, uh, uh, the results of their examination, and then they'll discuss then the treatment. So all of these are different pathways of activities, and they're based upon the idea that there is a particular sequence of activities. However, the sequence of those activities are associated with what is applicable to the particular workplace. That one of the key ones that's been reported here is moving through from engaging in activities where if you make a mistake it's not a problem and then moving on to more and more complex. So many years ago um, I was working in the clothing industry and, and as a, a pattern maker what I did first of all was make the interlining patterns for garments and also the lining patterns for garments and once I developed those skills I was allowed then to start cutting the patterns for the cloth components of garments. So once I developed the skills and the accuracy in my pattern making, smoothness of line, etc., I was allowed to move through. And then the final thing that um, I, I learned how to pattern cut was the making of collars, which are very important and have to be done prop properly. So these are um, models of curriculum. Now, how do we work out the, the pathway of of the experiences that we need to organize in a particular workplace. So developing the workplace curriculum. And from some studies done earlier, um, it would seem that, that the following are helpful. 
Firstly, we um, need to identify the sequence of act activities to be learned. So um, what, in what sequence should the activities ideally be learned? And then identifying those that are hard to learn. So why is that important? Well, one of the reasons for identifying um, tasks that are hard to learn is that um, these are the activities which most likely require particular support or particular augmentation. These are the activities which likely require particular workplace pedagogies to assist the learning. So there are lots of things that, as with the lived experience, you can learn through observation and imitation. There'll also be some things which require um, um, engagement and support to learn. So for instance, one of the few instances of teaching that you can identify in the anthropological literature associated with learning cultural practices is hands-on. And that is when potters place their hands upon the hands of apprentices to help them get the feel of the clay as the clay is turning on the, on the potter's wheel so they, they get the sense of it because it's difficult for the, no, the novice to get that, that sense of feel. So identifying those things which are hard to learn, they can become the target for um, for use, the use of, of, of um, practice pedagogies, which we'll talk about uh, tomorrow. It's also worthwhile when you're asking people about the, the activities that people engage in in the workplace is to use a, a basic you know, type such as asking them the things they do you know, daily, weekly, monthly or yearly, but also ask them about the things that they need to know but may never use. So by looking at things that are done daily, you get the sense of the routine activities that need to be learned. Then monthly things that occur from time to time, which are you know, um, not happening all the time but need to be done. And then yearly events that come up at least once a year. So for instance, hairdressers often find a real challenge in catering to a bridal party where all the women come in and there's a need to make their hair in some way look consistent and they might have very different types of hair, they might have very different types of history of treatments in their hair and this then becomes a, a task which they don't have to face every week but it comes up um, from time to time and this is something they need to learn to do. So you can ask people what they do you know, uh, daily, weekly, monthly. It's also interesting because in many workplaces there are particular times of the week or times of the day when work becomes very intense. So in the hospitality sector, for instance, the service time of meals or preparation for meals if you're working in the kitchen, these are very busy times. Um, also um, um, within hairdressing, for instance, you'll often find that it is Friday and Saturdays which is most busy and most intense, whereas during the week it be, can be quieter. But you might wonder, why should we try and find out things that people need to know but may never use? Well, let me give you an example. Most of us used to fly around a lot in planes um, and the, the cabin crew of planes need to know how to evacuate the plane if there's an emergency. Now, we, we hope that, that they never have to use those skills, certainly on the plane that we're flying in. But while, although they might not need to use them, um, they need to know how to evacuate the plane. So there's going to be tasks that people need to know that they may never have to use. So we need to find those and, and, and find ways of assisting learning the, those kind of capacities. So um, who are the best informants? Well, uh, I've interviewed people who are very experienced and people that are very recent. And one of the views I've formed is that people who have recently learned tasks are more aware of the difficulties and what was hard to learn than those who learnt them many years ago. So you might find it useful to try and identify people who've recently learned tasks because they're more likely to be able to remember and provide valid insights about the sequencing of activities and how best particular things are learned. 
On the way through, it's also worthwhile trying to identify what are sometimes called as teachable moments. That is particular experiences which are pedagogically rich. And one of these is nurses' handovers, which I'll come to later. And these are moments that um, are particularly potentially rich opportunities for learning. And often these are when a problem is being addressed and people have to consider the problem from a number of perspectives, talk about it, offer post potential solutions, and those solutions are then subject to debate and discussion, and then some resolution about how to proceed. Now, these are clearly rich learning experiences, and when they come as part of everyday work activity, they're also often richly built into the day's work and richly contextualized with the kind of thinking and acting which workers need to do. In this way, the learning then from those experiences can be quite rich. So um, sometimes it's also important to um, consider a particular kind of sequencing of experiences. So let me take an example here. And this is, um, it came from a study of midwifery students and how midwifery students need to, to learn the skills to be an effective midwife. And midwifery students engage in two kinds of practicum experiences. One is referred to as follow-throughs or continuity of care, and the other is clinical practice. So continuity of care is when the midwife engages and understands the circumstances of the birthing mother. And as students, what happens is they have to go along to all the meetings that the birthing uh, woman has with her gynecologist, with nurses, with any kind of medical specialist. But also if that woman's experiencing personal social difficulties, um, meetings with social welfare workers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then also uh, midwives engage in clinical uh, practice, which involves um, inspections of, 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 of the woman, the you know, baby in vitro, and using devices to take images and listen to heartbeats, etc. So the question that we were addressing is what should be the sequence of these experiences? And what we concluded from interviewing midwives and midwifery students is that the best thing to start with is the follow-throughs or the continuity of care that, so that the student midwife can become aware of the circumstances and situations of birthing women and engage in those and develop those understandings before they engage in clinical placements, which involves, as you'd be aware, very intimate examinations and can involve quite critical care decisions and quite critical uh, clinical engagements. So what we suggested then is that there were some kind of experiences which probably should precede the clinical experiences, and that is the midwifery students engaging with the birthing women to um, participate in those meetings they have with medical people, with midwives, but also if they've got issues in their lives, social workers and welfare agents, so they understand the birthing process from the perspective of the birthing woman prior to engaging in clinical placements. So that's the end of this brief um, recorded session and the activity arising from this is to get you to think about how the learning curriculum should play out in your workplace or with work with which you are familiar. So Thanks for um, uh, participating in this. I hope this is helpful. And Laurent now will be um, taking you uh, forward with this activity. Est-ce que vous m'entendez là
Oui. OK. Parce que j'ai une icône un peu bizarre sur mon, sur mon écran avec un point d'exclamation. Euh... Très bien, j'espère que vous avez pu euh, entendre correctement. Euh, voilà, donc c'était une session qui portait sur le, le concept de, de curriculum et la manière dont il peut être appliqué aux apprentissages en situation de, de travail. Euh, ce que je vous propose maintenant, c'est de vous mettre directement dans l'activité la, numéro 2, euh, qui vous permettra peut-être aussi entre vous de peut-être revenir sur certains concepts, euh, de les discuter entre vous. On passera aussi avec Aïla dans les... Euh, dans les sous-groupes. Euh, et puis, je voulais enfin, rapidement vous montrer la, la tâche, l'activité numéro 2. Euh, vous voyez mon écran ici Oui. OK. Donc, euh, comme le disait Steven à la fin de son, de son exposé, euh, il va s'agir pour vous de reprendre votre même situation de référence mais de l'observer du point de vue de la pratique curriculaire c'est-à-dire ah, d'appliquer un petit peu excuse-moi j'ai des problèmes euh, de, de euh, connexion avec mon ordi sur Zoom euh, qui viennent du curriculum pour euh, euh, mettre un petit peu en, en évidence certaines spécificités de, de votre euh, situation donc, euh, la question qui est posée ici, c'est quel serait le curriculum de l'apprentissage dans votre environnement de travail C'est-à-dire, si vous reprenez votre situation de, de référence, euh, quel a été le, le, le type d'organisation par lequel vous l'avez apprise Est-ce qu'il s'agissait d'un curriculum très informel ou est-ce qu'il y a une, une, une organisation très euh, repérable des expériences qui vous a permis d'apprendre votre euh, activité donc, on vous demande en particulier de partager à propos de la manière dont les expériences d'apprentissage devraient être découpées et organisées, donc à la fois en termes de séquences, en termes d'activités difficiles à apprendre, et puis en termes de moments propices pour faire l'objet d'un enseignement. Donc, ce que vous pourriez faire ici, c'est à la fois, euh, par rapport à la situation que vous avez vécue, essayer de repérer par quelle séquence, par quelle tâche difficile à apprendre vous êtes passé, et puis peut-être par quel moment particulièrement propice pour l'apprentissage vous êtes passé. Mais vous pourriez aussi vous mettre dans une position plus prospective en identifiant quelle aurait pu être la séquence, quelles auraient pu être, quelles auraient pu être les tâches difficiles à apprendre ou les moments particulièrement propices. Donc vous pouvez le faire à la fois sur le registre de description de ce qui vous est arrivé, mais vous pourriez aussi le faire sur un registre plus d'ingénierie ou de voir qu'est-ce qui pourrait être mobilisé pour structurer les apprentissages dans votre environnement. Et puis enfin, Steven Billet fait une distinction entre les, le curriculum prescrit, le curriculum réel et le curriculum expérimenté. Donc là aussi, on vous demande de réfléchir à cette distinction par rapport à votre propre situation de référence. Est-ce que vous avez... Euh, était confronté à un curriculum prescrit, formalisé, existant, ou est-ce qu'au contraire, euh, euh, il n'y en avait pas vraiment euh, Comment est-ce que ce curriculum a été vraiment implémenté Parce qu'au-delà du prescrit, il peut être plus ou moins implémenté. Et puis surtout, comment est-ce que vous l'avez euh, expérimenté Quelle a été la séquence euh, d'apprentissage qui a structuré votre, euh, euh, votre expérience euh, d'apprenant ou, ou, de, ou de formateur Voilà, donc l'idée, c'est de reprendre un petit peu ces ces catégories, de revisiter votre situation de référence euh, du point de vue de euh, la problématique du, euh, du curriculum, donc de, de la manière dont l'organisation de l'expérience peut soutenir ou pas euh, les apprentissages euh, en lien avec le, le travail. OK Est-ce que vous avez des questions de, de compréhension par rapport à la tâche Non C'est bon Ok, donc ce que je vais faire, c'est que je vais vous remettre dans les, euh, dans les mêmes sous-groupes qu'avant. Peut-être que ça ira aussi un peu plus vite parce que vous connaissez vos situations euh, de référence. Euh, on va vous laisser euh, jusqu'à 5h10. Et puis, on va se retrouver à 5h10 pour une brève session de, de synthèse et de clôture. Donc, il n'y aura pas vraiment un espace de restitution euh, formelle euh, collective comme on l'a fait tout à l'heure. Par contre, ce que je vous demanderai, c'est... En faisant le travail des sous-groupes, essayez peut-être d'identifier une question 
qui se posent dans votre groupe par rapport à cette, ce chapitre sur le curriculum que vous souhaiteriez poser à Stephen Billet demain matin. Donc demain matin, on va le retrouver pour toute la matinée et on commencera par une session de questions-discussion. Donc par rapport à ce chapitre sur le curriculum, peut-être que chaque groupe énonce une observation, une, une question, un objet de compréhension qu'on pourrait lui exposer, enfin que vous pourrez lui exposer demain dans, dans la session d'ouverture. Ok Et donc Aïla et moi, on va, on va circuler dans les, dans les groupes pour répondre à vos questions si, euh, si vous en avez. C'est tout clair Ok, donc on se retrouve à 16h50. Je vous enverrai un petit message. Euh, et puis, j'ouvre je, je, les salles et normalement, vous pourrez euh, accéder directement aux mêmes salles que tout à l'heure. Excusez-moi, Laurent, du coup, je n'ai pas l'invitation pour aller dans, euh, dans la... Dans le... Vous étiez dans quelle, dans quelle salle Le 4, groupe 4. Ah oui, il y a des personnes non affectées, c'est bizarre. Dans le groupe 4, il y a Isabelle, vous étiez dans quel groupe Merci. Dans le groupe 3. Dans le groupe 3. Et puis, Pascaline, vous étiez dans quel groupe 4. Groupe 4, alors je vous envoie dans le groupe 4. Ok. Il faut juste l'accepter. Voilà, Pascaline, vous pouvez accepter le groupe 4. Voilà. Bon, ça, ça va plus vite quand les groupes sont déjà faits, au fait. Ok. Euh, toi, Ila, tu veux aller dans le, le groupe 2 ou le groupe 1 Attends, Je ne t'entends pas. J'ai une, une invitation pour le groupe 2, mais oui. peut-être avant d'y aller, euh, oui. on peut juste se voir, j'ai quelques questions oui, de compréhension. Oui. oui. On, on désactive l'enregistrement Très bonne idée, oui. Bon. Euh, enfin, par rapport à Antoine qui avait des difficultés de connexion Oui, ouais, alors c'est bon. Okay. Oui, oui, ça j'ai eu. Ouais, c'est bon Antoine. Apparemment dans la voiture, c'est bon, c'est bon Antoine Il y a une connexion dans la voiture. <rire> oh là là, si vous saviez. <rire> ça veut dire quoi C'est à la recherche du Wi-Fi Exactement. <rire> Regardez comme je travaille. Ok. <rire> ah ouais, on s'organise comme on peut <rire> d'accord bon, faites attention, regardez quand même la route hein, surtout s'il y a de la neige ouais. c'est bon, je suis parqué le Jura hein. ok ah ouais, je l'attendais celle-là ah, <rire> donc maintenant votre nom c'est Laura Loreillette c'est ça oui absolument c'est un surnom que Maud et Alexandre m'ont gentiment donné ah, ok d'accord donc voilà, d'où la, la petite parenthèse. Ok, très bien. Magnifique, donc euh, nous sommes euh, tous là, je crois. Je vais juste réactiver la bonne fenêtre. Euh, voilà, parfait. Donc, euh, merci beaucoup pour vos échanges. C'est intéressant de vous entendre dans les, euh, les sous-groupes. Euh, on, on, comme je vous l'avais dit, on ne va pas vraiment faire un, un, un retour formel de chacun des, des sous-groupes. Euh, par contre, si vous avez vraiment un, une difficulté de compréhension, quelque chose qui a été thématisé dans les groupes que vous n'avez pas bien compris, on peut peut-être encore en, en discuter une ou deux minutes. Et surtout, ce que je vous avais demandé, c'était peut-être d'identifier... Euh, une question ou une interpellation ou une, un commentaire que vous pourriez relayer à Steven Villette demain matin en lien avec ce, ce chapitre. Euh, Est-ce que vous avez euh, des questions de compréhension qui sont, euh, qui sont apparues et qu'on pourrait répondre pour éviter que vous passiez une mauvaise nuit à essayer de vous euh, triturer l'esprit euh, sans fin 
Lorenz. Lorenz. Lucia. Euh, je vais donner la parole à Lucia. Elle a euh, écrit. Euh, voilà, je suis, je suis déconnecté en fait. Je suis... En fait, n'avait pas une question de compréhension spécifiquement avec les concepts, mais c'était une question de comment expliciter les, curi les trois différents curriculums dans les, justement les situations imprévues où il n'y a pas de routine, il n'y a pas de tâches spécifiques, où il y a une situation de crise et puis on doit gérer et apprendre dans cette situation. Et on disait qu'à ce moment-là, c'était difficile de définir les curriculums. Oui, c'est je crois aussi euh, un point qui a été discuté dans le groupe avec euh, Isabelle. Donc vous étiez plusieurs à être euh, dans les... Euh, ah bah oui, c'est le même groupe. C'est le même groupe, c'est ce même groupe. <rire> euh, J'ai de la peine parce que je... Euh, oui, ça, ça a été discuté en effet dans votre groupe, c'est comment est-ce qu'on fait face... Comment est-ce qu'on fait face à la... Comment est-ce qu'on applique la notion de, de curriculum dans des situations imprévues où tout à coup il y a un bouleversement complet Est-ce qu'on peut encore utiliser la, la notion de curriculum pour rendre compte de ces situations-là C'est vrai que c'est une question qui s'est posée enfin, typiquement dans le cadre de la situation d'Isabelle qui, qui doit tout à coup numériser les, les formations dans, dans l'urgence. Et puis c'est vrai qu'il y avait une autre question qui s'était posée dans un, dans un autre groupe, je crois que c'était le groupe 5, par rapport à la, à la question des, des situations informelles. Euh, Est-ce qu'on peut appliquer ces, 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 dix, ces trois sortes de curriculum prescrits, réels et expérimentés, expérienciés ou expérimentés euh, quand on est sur des, euh, des apprentissages plus, euh, plus informels Donc ça, ça fait partie, je pense, des questions qu'on pourrait poser à, à Steven Billet euh, demain. Ouais. Ok, ça vous, a, ça vous a intéressé cette, cette première journée Ça vous apporte un peu des, des éléments par rapport à à la thématique Je trouvais que c'était intéressant, mais c'était chargé quand même. Ouais, c'est chargé, ouais. C'est sûr. Euh, que oui, mais je pense que le fait d'être sur, sur Zoom aussi, on est, moi, je, moi je, c'est ce que je, on était en train de dire, c'est qu'on est un peu, moi, je suis un peu assommée en fait d'ordinateur. <rire> ouais. Mais euh, mais je pense que je suis pas la seule, évidemment. Mais mmh. c'est ça qui je pense qui est compliqué aussi. Ouais. Bon, c'est pour ça qu'on essaye d'alterner de des, des activités différentes, mais c'est sûr que toutes les activités sont sur l'ordinateur, puis elles sont, euh, elles sont en tant que telles fatigantes, c'est sûr. Non, moi, ce n'est pas vraiment ouais. le, le, la question de l'ordinateur. Enfin, je crois que j'ai trouvé que vous avez fait beaucoup d'efforts euh, aujourd'hui dans cette euh, construction de journée pour pouvoir nous faire des activités où chaque fois on pouvait repartir euh, sur du réel aussi, sur ce qui nous préoccupait. Moi, il y a eu des moments où j'ai eu des difficultés, c'est au niveau de l'anglais. Alors, je suis avec un jeune public, et moi, ça fait quand même un certain nombre d'années que je ne fais plus de l'anglais. Et je dois dire qu'à l'oral, comme ça, ça m'est plus compliqué qu'à l'écrit. Mmh. Et, euh, et des fois où j'aurais bien apprécié d'avoir juste une petite synthèse en français. On est deux, Isabelle. <rire> Oui, c'est sûr que bah, l'anglais, ça peut être une, une barrière. Il y a un certain nombre de ressources qui sont à disposition, notamment les, les, les documents écrits, mais c'est vrai que pour l'oral, ça, ça, c'est certainement compliqué. Puis ça ajoute sans doute aussi à la fatigue et à la, à la densité. Si jamais, il me semble que ça existe, je sais, je sais que ça existe pour Teams, mais je ne sais pas pour Zoom, de... L'animateur, il peut allumer les, la traduction écrite de ce qui est dit. Ah Et Oui, instantané, peut... oui, il y a, il y a effectivement quelque chose. Directement il y a une coche la... à mettre, c'est juste. Oui, il y a une coche sais. à mettre dans les paramètres, effectivement, il y a un truc. Oui. Ouais. Ça, je n'ai jamais ah. testé, mais j'attends de voir si ça marche. Ça, il y a aussi des possibilités avec, euh, avec YouTube de pouvoir faire des traductions ou les sous-titres. Euh, voilà, après si on lit du texte euh, pendant une journée ça ne va pas forcément être euh, plus, euh, plus reposant mais après on peut peut-être essayer euh, demain de faire euh, de mandater l'un d'entre nous pour faire une, une brève synthèse après l'exposé qui veut se lancer on regarde demain 
Ouais. Non, non, non. On va demander à Lorenz ou bien euh, qui, a, qui, a, qui a parlé en anglais aujourd'hui. A dit, il parle super bien anglais. Mathéo, ouais. il est top. Il... Il avait un bon accent et tout, je trouve que c'est… Ah, moi, je trouve que Fadi, il a un bon background. <rire> Mathieu, c'est America. <rire> bon, après, c'est clair que c'est aussi euh, l'occasion pour vous de vous confronter à une, une expérience nouvelle. Mais... Bon, après, il a un anglais qui est quand même relativement plus compréhensible que d'autres. Euh, oui, ouais, puis il a un débit de parole qui, clairement, est adapté. Euh, il ne parle, il parle pas très vite, je veux dire, par rapport à d'autres que j'ai pu entendre. C'est vrai que l'anglais de Lawrence était aussi très, très compréhensible et je pense qu'il comprend bien tout ce qui est. En fait, on va demander à Lawrence de faire l'exposé de demain. En fait. Exactement. Comme ça, il sera bien passé pour le traduire en français. Euh, bon, C'est vrai qu'autrement, les, les capsules vidéo, vous pourrez les, les regarder encore si jamais euh, elles existent. Euh, L'avantage de l'enregistrement, c'est qu'on peut y revenir. Mais... Euh, voilà, on essaiera de, de voir si, si on peut faire quelques petites reformulations. Euh, mais ce n'est jamais facile de, de, de traduire 30 ou 40 ou 50 minutes d'exposé de, en, en, quelques, en quelques idées. OK. Autrement, sur le, le fonctionnement de la journée, ça, il y avait d'autres commentaires Je trouve assez intéressant les sous-groupes sur Zoom. Mm -hmm. Il y a une plus grande, plus grande sentiment de groupe qu'en vrai, qu'en présentiel. Il y a plus de quoi J'ai pas entendu. Un sentiment de groupe. Ah ouais, il y a plus de sentiment de groupe. Ouais. Il y a okay. une participation plus facile en virtuel mm. qu'en présentiel. Ok. Moi, j'avais jamais fait les, les sous-groupes avec Zoom. C'est la première fois. Vous en aviez fait Vous aviez fait d'autres expériences de, de ce type-là mm -hmm. Mais c'est vrai que je trouve que la, la qualité de vos échanges dans les sous-groupes, elle est vraiment remarquable. Donc. Euh... C'est un, un bon format aussi, mais après, comme vous dites, ça, ça vous sollicite beaucoup parce que vous êtes toujours quand même dans la tâche et puis euh, sur, la, sur la journée, c'est fatigant. Ok, autre, autre commentaire Ok, donc dans ce cas-là, demain, on va fonctionner euh, un peu comme aujourd'hui, donc ce sera matinée euh, avec, euh, avec Billette. On commencera par une heure. On va lui relayer les questions que vous avez identifiées aujourd'hui, plus aussi celles que j'ai un peu notées de notre session du début de l'après-midi. Et puis ensuite, il nous présentera ce qu'il appelle la, les, les pratiques pédagogiques et les, et les pratiques épistémiques. Et puis, on aura l'occasion de, de travailler aussi ces, ces concepts en lien avec vos situations de, de référence. Donc, comme je vous le disais aussi, note, enfin, toutes les notes que vous prenez, puis j'ai vu dans certains groupes, vous, vous prenez des notes parmi, ça c'est super comme idée. C'est des éléments que vous pourrez aussi euh, recycler dans votre travail de, de validation. C'est un peu le, le carburant de votre, de votre travail de validation. Donc, ça, ça vous sollicite beaucoup, mais ça vous, pré, ça vous prépare aussi le travail pour, pour après. Ok, je vous souhaite une bonne soirée. Reposez-vous. Vous m'accordez deux minutes après Bonne soirée. Euh, oui, je, je, je reste en ligne. J'arrête l'enregistrement.